Okay, one more minute. It's 944 and we'll get started again. All right, it is 945. So just a, another quick thing, just a reminder, if um, you've joined in a little bit later, please put your name uh, in the chat. So Janet needs that. We're going to need that um, for certificates. Um, you do need to attend the full meeting in order to get the four hours of recertification. That's important. Um, and of course, uh, you can always email us. We'll, uh, Stacey, I think we'll put it in there at education at nola.gov. If there's any questions or let's say, um, please give us about a, a, you know, a week and a half, two weeks or so to get everybody their certificates. Um, but if you don't get one, just make sure you reach back out to us at education at nola.gov. We'll check the roster um, with that. Okay, so um, all right. So the next presenter is uh, Timmy Rydair. He's uh, been with us again for a long time. He's our urban rodentologist. Many on the call know him already. And um, he's going to talk about really doing that really thorough inspection of, a, let's say, a kitchen, commercial property, and what to look for um, as it pertains to rodents. So, Timmy, take it away. Okay, let me do share screen. Okay. And let me pull up the right thing on my share screen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to jump right into this. Uh, more than just kitchen inspections, this is going to be about road inspections in general, because if you can handle the kitchen, you can handle everything. And kitchens are pretty cookie cutter, guys, but we're going to get into everything with this more specific. So when we're doing our inspections, guys, we're looking for details. These are small animals who leave small clues behind. So we're doing detective work, trying to piece together puzzles. So um, everybody's heard the, the urban legend about the rats coming through the sewer systems. Well, it's not an urban legend. Uh, we'll lead into this with why good inspections are so important and why paying attention to detail is so important because we were dealing with this in a city facility where the rats were entering through a toilet on the second floor of the building and we couldn't figure out how because rats are amazing swimmers and capable of doing this generally going up about one floor, but two floors is a lot. So this building actually had a basement and upon inspecting the basement, we found that that's a sewer kick out right there. It was missing the drain cover on it. So the rat was able to come up from the sewer, come out, take a breath, and then go back in the pipe to make it to the second floor of the building. Without a proper inspection, guys, you'll never solve these problems. And the pest control guys will never solve them either. They'll eternally be trapping and baiting, uh, which is not a good cycle. Not when, as you see in these next set of pictures here, if you look on the, uh, the picture on the left-hand side, you see there's a, a color photo of what we're dealing with with that gaping hole. Guys, it costs $3.50 to buy the plug for that and took me five minutes to install it to permanently solve the issue with the rats coming in. And mind you, with the use of the cameras too, Cameras were amazing because it allowed us to see that whether or not we had sealed all the rats out when we sealed the pipe, which obviously we hadn't because you see on the right hand picture, we caught one of our rats there. But this was a combination of inspections, paying attention to detail, and then using technology to tie it all together to solve a problem. You know, the game cameras verified where the animals were entering It verified when we caught all the animals so we knew our job was done. So you know, inspections work. And here's our finished product with our, our actual cover on that drain that's allowing these animals not to enter. So when you're doing these inspections, guys, these are things you're gonna see in kitchens too. Look under the sinks, are the pipes all connected together? Uh, do they actually connect or do they just, uh, I've been in restaurants where the pipes just drain straight to the floors because they had floor drains. Well, a lot of times when people are rinsing stuff out of these sinks, 
food debris as well comes rinsing out these drains and just sits on the floor until it gets washed in the drain. Well, this becomes a buffet for rodents and roaches and other animals to come and gather in these areas and feed. So, you know, it's important and we overlook little details like this because we're not plumbers. Why would we look at pipes? But guys, we need to look at everything when we're doing our inspection because rodents will find that little niche. They're like little velociraptors, always going out and testing our perimeters to see if they can make it in and out and get through where they can go through at. Awesome. Well, we need to look closer at that so we can see where they're coming in and out at. Okay, for inspection tips, things I tell people uh, first, when I get to a building, I ask, what are the rodents feeding on? That's one of the first things I want to know. Uh, fruit preference is passed through the milk by the mothers to the babies. But also, I want to eliminate access to this food type if possible. Uh, you know, limit what they're feeding on. We can starve it out. I should have started. In fact, I should start every presentation with this, guys. Uh, I'll tell you, and I should charge everybody $1,000 for this tip, guys. It is the best tip ever for rodent control. In fact, for pest control in general, sanitation is key. If you keep a place clean, you can starve most pests out so they won't even stick around if they come. I mean, rodents require a large amount of food every day because they have very high metabolism. So we can eliminate those food sources. The animals will leave on their own. Uh, and the other great thing is if we figure out that food type, and I know you guys are sanitarians, but if I was working from a pest control point of view, I want to use that food type as a bait type uh, in my snap traps and in my other traps because, you know, they're, they already have a preference for it. So they're going to go to it quicker and be way more accepting of it. Now, when we're doing our inspections, look for warm, dark, quiet areas. And I love the question that was asked earlier about uh, will they travel from a shed in the backyard to a house to infest? Uh, oh, yeah. Because think about it like this. Your, your sheds in your backyard, they're dark and they're quiet and they're usually warm, too. Uh, they're closed in from the elements. And that's perfect for rodents. That's what they're looking for. And as Claudia said, too, we store our bird seed or our excess, uh, sometimes excess dog food or pet food will get stored in garages things like that. What else do we store in garages? People tend to put clutter in there, paper clutter, uh, sometimes old clothing and things like that. So we're putting bedding in there. So we're creating these little uh, perfect habitats for rodents in our backyards where once they wear out that food source that was there originally, whether it be cockroaches or bird seed or whatever, they're going to move on to the house to go looking. And they'll use that as their little base of operations because like I said, dark and quiet. So if we're doing inspections in kitchens, dark and quiet, right? Uh, under sinks, under, uh, oh, underneath tables, prep tables. Always look to the back leg that's in the back corner of against the wall because even the best restaurants I find and the, the guys who are really great at cleaning often forget that back leg against the corner wall. Uh, where it's so hard to get to and those prep tables are stainless steel. It's not like you can move them. Some of them are permanently bolted in place. But if you get down on your hands and knees and look back at that back leg, I guarantee nine out of 10 times, there's going to be food caked around it because when they're sweeping and mopping, those uh, the brooms and the mops push food back into that corner and it accumulates around the base of the leg. Well, guess what? The rodents have figured this out too. So, and I'm, as I'm saying this, get on your hands and knees, guys. This is dirty work. Rodent work is dirt is one of the dirtiest jobs that you can do, and it, it's so get used to it. Uh, you know, wear dirty clothes with you when you do this. I have special clothes designated for inspections because. I know that I'm going to get covered in grease and food particles and filth in general. Um, you know, there are ways around this too, knee pads and other things so that you don't have to be constantly kneeling and, and all this toxic nastiness that's on the ground there. But that is required to do a proper inspection. If you come back from an inspection and your knees aren't dirty, you probably didn't do the inspection right. So, and when we're doing our inspection, suggest things to them too. Can you eliminate this food source? Can you eliminate this water source? Can you eliminate this harbor source? Because think about it, when you're going in restaurants and uh, food processing areas, a lot of times they have a lot of uh, unnecessary garbage laying around, especially cardboard boxes, which that's havens for these guys. Uh, storage rooms where they store stuff that's been there way too long, food that's gone, gone rancid or worse. That uh, they have a pro uh, The way you're supposed to stock food is you move the oldest food to the front and replace in the back with the new food, right? Well, a lot of restaurants don't do this and a lot of storage places won't do this. They just keep stacking the new stuff and leave that old stuff back there. And they don't realize that over the years, the rats have managed to get into it. They can chew through some of these cans and some of these other things over time. And it's food sources that we overlook because we're not paying close enough attention. So that should be one of the things to take away from this. Uh, pay close attention on your inspections because remember tiny animals leave tiny evidence. Uh, 
I know, like I said, we're going to skip a couple of these things because you guys aren't pest control guys, but you're looking at what pest control guys do when you're out there. So that's something to pay attention to where they're putting their devices and things like that when you do see them. You might think sometimes that there's no point to it, and maybe the pest control guy saw something you didn't. And there's actually a lot of logic behind the placement, or sometimes, sadly, there's no logic behind a placement. It's just put out because they're doing cookie cutter pest control. So, but a lot of times, though, I find more and more that people are actually paying attention now and actually doing better road control. So, like I said, they are leaving behind numerous clues for us. Uh, and that's another thing. Okay. Patience is required on inspections, guys. We can't just do a 15, 20 minute inspection of a restaurant. And I understand everybody, time is money. We're all on a schedule. We all have a, probably a quota to reach or something like that. But we need to tone it back some with that because if you rush through an inspection, you're going to miss stuff. Uh, it really needs to be taken slowly and given the proper time. Some buildings are larger than others. You know, a kitchen and a gas station versus the kitchen and a five star restaurant are going to take a substantially different amount of time. You know, and it'd be surprising. You might end up spending more time at that gas station kitchen. Uh, it's all about who has the worst issues and how close of attention you have to pay. Uh, <clears throat> When you're doing all this though, uh, suggest exclusion methods, suggest sanitation methods. Uh, try to educate them while you're, while you're showing them what's wrong. It's, you, you do a lot better with people if you don't come down as a hammer and you come down as a teacher and you try to work with them a bit on it. Uh, and sometimes it takes uh, two people working together on a problem to solve it because maybe the, maybe the business owner is fully aware of the issues they have and they just hadn't, they don't have the education that you have. So they haven't thought of ways to solve it. Uh, so yeah, it takes working together. So uh, Claudia's already mentioned these, but we're going to get right into them and a lot deeper into these. These are what you're looking for on your inspections. And these are things that you find in kitchens and everywhere else, uh, be it dining rooms as well, storerooms and such. But this is what you're going to be looking for guys. Uh, so we'll jump into droppings first. I love this picture. This is an awesome picture, guys, because, um, and I know to you guys, you're like, oh my God, that's disgusting. Look at all the road droppings. But uh, this picture tells me an amazing story because it's got all three commensal rodent species droppings in one picture, as well as American cockroach droppings in there, which tells us something because, guys, biologically, these animals should not want to interact with each other too often. In fact, Norway rats often prey on new roof rats and house mice when they have the opportunity. The issue is in this building where, where we were working at the time, excuse me, at the time, uh, they had so much food, these animals, oh, I'm sorry, was somebody has a question or something? I need a new page for it. Okay, well, let's keep going. Uh, so yes, uh, all these droppings at once, that meant that they had so much food that these animals went against their nature and their instinct, and they didn't care that they had roof rats and nori rats and house mice around. These animals all lived in the same structure together and they all had their own little niched areas carved out in it. But this was like their, where their territories met. So everybody would come every night and put their droppings down and mark it. And this is just disgusting, full of pathogens, but these are things we can find. And like I said, this was in a storeroom of a restaurant. Uh, this restaurant's no longer exist actually. This was one of our success stories. But this was one of those situations where it was just horrible. <laughs> And guys, that's what we're looking for though. And on the droppings, we'll talk about details of what we're looking for. Uh, think of, uh, let's see, here we go. We have some pictures for scale size, beautiful. Uh, those are house mouse droppings, guys. And think of a grain of rice, only jet black. And they look a lot similar to American cockroach droppings, but the easy way to tell when we can see in these droppings, look at those pointed ends on them. On the American cockroach droppings, you're gonna have a cut end where it's gonna be flat, uh, but on these, you have nice little pointed tips. And if you look really close with a, with a magnifying glass or hand lens, you can see hairs in the droppings. This is going to be common across all the rodents. That's a good way to tell, too, that it's not lizard or roach or anything. The hairs and the points on the end. Also, in lizard droppings, you're going to get little white specks or in gecko droppings the same. But uh, this tells us so much, too. A uh, brief little backstory on the photo, guys. That's the back of my toilet. Uh, that's the top of my toilet tank. So um, I have a bad habit of reading a lot and I leave books around the house. So I left a bunch of books stacked on back to the toilet at one point, uh, was away for work for a while and I came back and cleaned up. And when I did, there was a gap between the books. A mouse had gotten in my house of all places. Uh, sometimes I think they're plotting against me, but 
and he decided to take up residence on top of my toilet. Uh, if you looked at yellow uh, staining on there, that's mouse urine. Uh, so he was hanging out in here. I found him. He died in my closet. And the cool thing is these droppings are telling us something too. These are not typical house moth droppings. Normally they're a lot more uniform. If you look, you can see these are just disshapen and disjoined. Uh, this animal was dying of dehydration in my house because it didn't have a water source. It was eating my soap. To show you how versatile the food is. It was eating ivory soap uh, and living on it, oddly enough. Uh, not happily, because like I said, I ended up finding the animal's carcass. It was a little juvenile house mouse in my closet. But yeah, it's telling us so much in this. Uh, but yeah, that's about house mouse droppings. Think a grain of rice, only jet black. Okay, uh, D-Tex, this is more for pest control guys, but I'll throw this out there for you guys too, because D-Tex is just awesome. And in case you're ever on a job and you start seeing these uh, yellow fluorescent droppings, that means someone's using D-Tex, which is a monitoring bait we use to track rodents. Uh, it's just amazing stuff because it makes uh, the droppings glow under UV light. So it's very easy to track rodents back to where they're nesting and where they're feeding if you learn how to follow droppings and what you're looking for. But this is also showing you guys what healthy house mouse droppings look like. Uh, see how these versus the last picture, these are well, way more defined. They're easily told that it, it, you can't not know that that's house mouse droppings, you know, unless they're just, it's very beautiful picture. Uh, but I could talk about DTEX for days too, but we're not going to. Okay, inspection tips, guys. Uh, drop ceilings. Uh, so many people overlook drop ceilings in buildings, and this is probably one of our main spots where rodents are living, especially house mice. Uh, they can spend their whole lives up there sometimes, and it's just perfect for them. Because remember what I said we were looking for, right? Dark, quiet, and warm. So that, that fits a drop ceiling perfect. It's got insulation in it. It's got pipes running through with condensation so they can go up there and lick and get, get their moisture. And oh, mice, I'm not sure if Claudia mentioned this or not, but they're amazing at uh, water retention and such. They can get a majority of their moisture from their diet, from what they're eating. And they can actually go months without drinking water. Uh, it's not, they can't go forever, but they can go a very long time just based on what they're eating and getting moisture out of it. Rats don't have that, that neat ability, but it makes mice just, like I said, the drop ceilings become perfect. Also, what's in your drop ceilings? When you think about it, you have a whole little ecosystem up there too. You've got uh, American cockroaches, silverfish, probably some geckos or something like that. So there's prey for mice. Uh, and if you want to know if you, if you have a mouse infestation, a really cool way to know too, especially in these restaurants you're working in and in these kitchens, you're going to find glue boards put out because people love glue boards, which uh, they're great for monitoring and they're actually really good for cutting down roach populations, but you have to pick them up as you catch roaches because house mice love to eat these guys. Other roaches will eat other roaches too. But yeah, if you're doing inspections and you look at a glue board and all you find on the glue board are wings and legs of a roach, that's because the house mice are coming and eating those roaches, the, the body and leaving just the wings and legs behind. This goes for if you're finding in your house or just on the floor somewhere. So when you're inspecting these kitchens, pay attention to that because it's easy to see just, you know, a pair of wings on the floor, or some legs on the floor and go, okay, well, they've got roaches, but you miss the big problem. You miss the mice. So like I said, detail work. We're looking for these little things, these clues, these animals leaving behind that they've been there. Okay. Another spot that gets overlooked, uh, the hollow block windows, uh, buildings. We're talking about like cinder block buildings. Uh, guys, those little wall voids in there, in those uh, blocks, those are mouse and rat condos. And Think about it, the outside of a building, especially if you're doing a box store, like a grocery store or something like that, or a general store. Uh, the outside of those are hollow block walls. It's very cheap, very common construction material. But when we start looking, at some point, someone busted a hole in that wall, probably to run conduit or a water pipe or something, or water line, or maybe it was just an accident. But they rarely get patched. And if that hole is a quarter inch or bigger, then mice can get in. If that hole is a half inch or larger, then rats can get in. So, and those, when you start going around these buildings, I always tell people to bring a ruler on inspections with you. Okay, not only does it make you look professional, it's required to do your job correctly. So you're going and you're measuring these holes and seeing can, can animals enter these holes? Because that should be something you're paying attention to because it's not just about, are they in the kitchen? It's about how are they getting into the kitchen? How are they entering the structure to begin with? Can we fix that? Uh, and cardboard boxes, guys, I had mentioned that earlier in storerooms. Uh, mice love cardboard boxes. You want to find where your, where your mice are nesting, start emptying that closet full of cardboard boxes. And probably the last one all the way in the back, you're going to find a little hole that's about a quarter inch big where the mice are entering in. 
Uh, this is really common in schools because schools love the hardcore board, uh, but restaurants too, especially in their storerooms. And they overlook it because they go, well, we don't store food in here. Well, as we said earlier, you know, the, the rats will nest 50 yards from your house and in a, you know, or 50 feet from your house in a shed in the backyard and then travel back and forth to the house with no problem. Well, guess what? Mice can have really small territories, 10 to 30 feet sometimes. They can also have larger territories if necessary, where they'll go beyond 30 feet. It's if the need drives them and if the place is there to live. So they could be hiding in a storeroom that only holds, let's say, like liquor items, things that are kept in glass that would not draw rodents in. But it's dark, it's quiet, and it's warm. And all they have to do is come out at night and you didn't clean out the, the trap on your dishwasher. So they're traveling every night to your dishwasher to clean a trap out there, going back to their cardboard boxes to live. So like I said, detective work, guys, looking at things like this. Hopefully these tips help you guys to improve your inspections, to find these problems that get overlooked sometimes because why would we look for rodents in a quiet storeroom, right? There's no food in there. That doesn't mean they're not there nesting. Okay, and rat runs, this is a great picture. Like Claudia said, this is an old picture though. And it just goes to show the inspections. First, it, you, we should all marvel at the fact that, as Claudia said, this, this is a Norway run. And our Norways and New Orleans top out generally a little less than a pound, or we have gone over a pound a few times. Most of our rats are about 14 ounces, uh, 12 to 14 ounces for Norway. Roof rats about 10, 12 ounces. But look at this path through that grass, okay? Think about it like this. An animal that weighs less than a pound, or uh, I don't think one did it. I think a whole team of these guys did it because it's Norway, so it's a colony. But think how many times these animals have to run back and forth to wear the grass out like that. That is just staggering. So we know they're traveling that path at high rates. We know that can is an issue. And it's a solvable issue with a rodent-proof trash can, actually, or a rodent-resistant trash can. I hate using the word rodent-proof because – like I said, little velociraptors are always testing our, our perimeters. They will beat even the best thing eventually, give them time. But looking closer with our rodents, like I said, detail work. So I saw that trash can, I looked inside of it and on the side of the bag, I see on the left, on the left hand picture, these little spots look like something snagged the bag as it got thrown in. But when I look even closer, you start counting out the claw marks and the track marks where these animals are climbing in and out of the bag. And this is the actual bag from that trash can. So when you look, go back real quick, they could have chewed through the bottom of the trash can to get in, but they chose not to because they figured out that it was easier and required less effort for them just to climb in and eat. So like I said, it's when we tell people put stuff away in plastic bins, this it does help tremendously, guys, because it's not that rats won't chew through plastic. It's that they they're think of them like water in a lot of ways because they take the path of least resistance. If they have an easier route to go, they're going to go the easier route. They're going to avoid chewing through the plastic if there's an easy meal on side of it. So yeah, that's why they're going over the can and not through the bottom. And when we look in, we see our track right here on the bag where our rat was looking, was climbing in and out and we see our rat waiting for us. So yeah. Okay, when inspecting guys, lines and shadows are things to look for. When we say lines, uh, pipe runs, things like that. Uh, if there's a pipe chase on the wall or something where uh, things are running, if there's electric lines running somewhere, um, even shelving and things like that become lines because the way rodents are seeing the world, they're seeing it like where they're from. And these guys are from forest and from jungles and woodland areas where they're not seeing lines. They're seeing vines. They're seeing tree branches. They're seeing uh, cliff faces and things like that when they look at our world. So they're seeing it very different. And shadows are a key thing to look for because, guys, they're prey animals. Shadows and darkness mean safety to them where predators can't see them and come and get them. So when you're doing your inspections, guys, where are the shadows in a kitchen? Under that stove, under that prep table, under that dishwasher. Where are the lines at? As I said, the dishwasher. There you go. You're going to have water lines running to that. You're going to have uh, gas lines running to stoves. And so that means we have to look beneath, between, and behind everything. Uh, look behind the stove. That gets overlooked so many times that I see that the rats are entering right behind a stove. And no one wants to get behind it because it's really hot and it's hot in summer here. So you don't want to be in a hot kitchen longer than you have to. Well, tough. That is part of our job. Buck it up and we have to go in there in that hot kitchen and we have to sweat and we have to look behind the stove because that's where they're probably coming in. There's a, you know, there's a gas line coming through hollow blocks there. If we overlook stuff just because it's inconvenient or uncomfortable, we're not going to get our job done correctly. So burrows, droppings, rub marks, these are visual indicators we're looking for. Uh, we talked about droppings. We're going to talk about rub marks a bit in a minute too and all marks. 
Uh, and Claudia's already discussed the, the null marks extensively already too, so it was awesome because you can tell the difference between species just based on, on null marks and measuring them. Uh, so it's really cool. If you guys want to learn about that, that is something where you go on inspection, you can actually write them up for the specific species based on droppings or null marks if you're getting really good at your job. And to me, that's it's not tough to do, and it's just awesome. And Janet, I heard her talking about their stinkive odors that they have. Guys, <clears throat> especially those of you here in South Louisiana, walk into a restaurant and take a big inhale. You can usually smell if they have rats. Mice, uh, it has to be really bad, but I, I can pick it up. Uh, there's a hamburger place I used to go to. I had to quit going to because the mouse smell got so bad. And I told them, look, you have mice. And they looked at me, how do you know? I said, you, that smell you smell, that's, that's house mouse. So, and if you smell it at this level, you have a bad infestation. <clears throat> Normally, if we were in person at this point, I would make you guys smell my scent jars because yes, I have jars of rat and mouse scent. Sadly, I don't have a roof rat scent being as we can't keep them in cages, uh, but I do have a Norway and house mouse scent. And there's actually a little bit of a difference between male and female of each species. It's It takes a lot to notice a difference, but it's there. It's minute, but it's, it's still present. But guys, if you wanna train on this and learn, uh, there's a great example where you don't have to keep rats in your office like I do. Uh, you can go down to Petco or PetSmart or any pet shop that keeps rats and mice. And if you ask them to, for them to let you smell that tank, believe me, they're going to they're gonna give you a weird look, but they'll let you do it. They won't even charge you. They'll probably laugh at you when you might get sick from it. Uh, but guys, this is a teaching tool. This is a smell I would definitely want to know if I was the average citizen because, like I said, I walk into a French Quarter restaurant sometimes and I'll be like, okay, I'm not eating here walk right back out. Uh, but in the kitchens especially, you can tell when, uh, I've been in a restaurant and they fixed their rat problem, but they had, the building's almost 300 years old and they had rats so bad for so long, the smell won't go away at this point, uh, which is sad for the restaurant, but, because I mean, there are no more rats there, but it's it sticks especially. So this is something for, if you're doing cleanup work, we have to rip that insulation out those walls sometimes and out the ceilings to get that odor to go away because it's so pungent. Okay, on a null marks for a second, guys. Uh, this is more of a homeowner picture than a uh, business picture, but hey, for a, it, it's a typical picture, especially if you're doing a warehouse or storeroom area with, that has a, a rolling door. That's the sweep at the bottom of the rolling doors. When you look at them and look at the corners of these garage doors, I could go to pretty much any house in New Orleans to take this picture if they have a garage door because a rat, a rat or a mouse has probably chewed through it. Uh, and they do make uh, high quality sweeps that the rodents can't chew through. I do recommend that. But guys, this is a telltale sign. Start looking for those null marks. Look at the corners of doors when you go in them. Uh, see if something's chewed through it. Uh, I mean, this this is uh, the restaurant in question where I've been taking a lot of my pictures for this presentation today. This was their back door. This restaurant was open for a long time. Uh, and we could see that the, 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 did the rats do this overnight? Because I love it when I first time I ever went to this restaurant, the people tried to convince me that was new damage. Uh, that is not new damage. That was not done overnight. That was not done by one rat. And that's a pretty cool little behavioral thing too. Guys, they take turns chewing those holes. It's not like one rat did all the work. No, they'll do work for a little while, take a break, another rat will come and take his turn chewing and so on and so forth. But look at it too. We're talking about rub marks and all that. Look at that. That is a beautiful rub mark on there. When you look even closer, guys, to, the, to that pipe right here, once you get inside that hole into the building, that discoloration right there, that's a rub mark too on that ground right there. So yeah, these rodents are telling us exactly how they're entering their structure, exactly what needs to be fixed to keep them out, and exactly where control items need to be placed, be it a station or a trap. Uh, it's just the signs are there if we learn to read them. And uh, Claudia showed this picture earlier, so it's just one of my favorites because uh, that's urine right there. That's urine and sebum. Uh, we have sebum on the wall and we have urine on the floor. So, and yeah, there was a bait station there. So it makes this shape perfect. So that, yeah, all the technician needed to do was pay attention to where that urine trail was and move the station over about three three inches, put the hole lined up with the entry hole, and the rodents would have walked right into his bait station or right into his trap if he put it there because there's all those nice pheromone markers where it's telling these guys where to go. So they can travel even in a pitch black and dark where rat rodents can't see in the dark. Uh, so they just have all these extra abilities that make it so they can maneuver in the dark as if they could see. 
Uh, so he's walking out and he's got his vibrissi forward. There's a little whiskers on him. And they're running at high speed because he's learned this trail. It's marked so well. I mean, these guys wrote us a novel in biology and, and symbols that they left for us here if we just not learn how to read it. Okay, and then my, one of my favorite rub mark stories, uh, which just was included too, where, guys, I do this all the time. I recommend you guys do it on your inspections too. When you see rub marks like that, carve your initials in it. Carve the date in it if you can. And people say, carve, really? When you take a knife to this or the edge of a screwdriver or any type of, uh, any type of edge, even a nail will do it, uh, it's going to peel away and it's going to be like wax. So think of it like rat wax, where if you, and with your rubber gloves on, mind you, you can, you can peel away some of this and then roll it into a little ball. Uh, and that's, that's how gooey and waxy and how, how thick this stuff gets sometimes. But if we look really close at the picture on the left, I love this too. Our pest control guy, he had his trap in the wrong spot. Uh, first, it's not set, but, and he wasn't pre-baiting. But next, it's there's all kinds of things wrong with the trap in the situation. But he missed it because he wasn't paying attention. That rat came out every night, and it didn't turn left and run toward his trap. No, the rat came, turned right, and went around and ran right back onto the other side to get to uh, – it was actually a trash can on the other side that was left there every night. So, yeah, and I'm carving – I say carve your initials in this or carve a symbol or something in it because you can come back the next day, and if there's a lot of activity, it'll be covered up. That's how much sebum these animals put out, how much of that body oil and wax, and how often they mark their trails so that they keep them up. So that in a day or two, my initials will be gone. That's also a good way to see if the problem's been solved or not. By leaving your initials or the date carved in that wax, you can come back in a month, and if your initials are still there, they don't have an active rat problem probably. Or that or the rodents figured something out and have changed their, uh, their patterns of movement, which does happen too. But nine out of 10 times, it's usually they've, you've, you've killed out the population at this point. If you are able to carve your initials, come back in a week and they're still there. Uh, we talked about the I smell a rat too. Oh yeah, roaches, guys. This is a little line out for you. I know this is a rat, a rat day, but roaches have their own distinct odor too. Uh, I wish I could buy a jar of that. But for those of you who have been in restaurants and in storerooms that have just horrible roach issues, you'll know the smell I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> If anybody's familiar with Max Force roach, uh, roach bait, it smells just like American cockroach. They nailed it. So that's something, too. And all this has to be cleaned up. Guys, uh, the restaurants have to clean it up, too. It's not just eliminating the rodents. It's also going back behind, cleaning up all this urine, all these droppings, all these rub marks. Because otherwise, it's a beacon to any other rodents looking for a place to move in. They can smell when another rodent has put down droppings. And... Uh, we're only now beginning to piece together the puzzles that they're that and these messages that they left behind in their urine and their droppings and what they're saying to each other and whether they're saying hey guys even though we don't know you this is a good place you know so yeah everything has to be cleaned after everything has to has to be done right uh, and dust i love this picture on the left guys if anybody's from this from south louisiana or, or uh, the south of the gulf coast in general you'll recognize that that is the, the kind of trays we usually put ball crawfish or crabs or shrimp onto. And this is in an, in an attic of a restaurant. And guys, that, that's rat tracks all over that. And that's dust, the natural dust that occurs in attics. So when you're doing your inspection, look for things like that because everywhere gets dusty and dirty, right? You're hoping these kitchens don't, that they're keeping up a good job of cleaning. But remember I said beneath, between, behind, there's spots where they're never going to clean in that restaurant, where you're going to have layers of dust or film or grease. And when we start looking at it, we can find rat tracks in it. We can find evidence that these animals have been present. So, and the worst thing is with that tray on that side, guys, how much you want to bet that it wasn't even washed probably before they put it back in use. They probably just took it out the attic and threw seafood on and started serving people. When it's covered in rat tracks, no doubt urine, probably some droppings have gotten on it. Uh, there's sebum on it. You know, I don't know for a fact it was reused, but it would not surprise me. It's just too typical that people just, they wouldn't, and I can't blame the restaurant because they don't know what rat tracks are. They don't know what that smudge is. Yeah, it'd be good practice to wash your stuff you take out of your storage rooms, but, you know, whatever. Okay, the picture on the right-hand side, yeah, Claudia explained that's from a fire extinguisher, uh, but I love this because that's mouse tracks, and uh, they're just little tiny divots. It's really hard to get great pictures of mouse tracks, which we do now, but that's in a future presentation. Uh, yeah, little dots, but see the little the little smears behind it? That's the tail drags. That's where when the animal walks, he stops every now and then because he hears a sound or he smells something different. So he stops to explore and uh, to hold on a second to make sure he's safe and there's no predators around for him. But these are things we're looking for. 
those little specks, those little tail drags. And like I said, it's on stuff that's you wouldn't expect or that most people overlook. So that's what we're trying to learn today. We're trying to learn to not overlook things, to look at what other people would just ignore. Uh, oh, what a great picture, too. This is up in a drop ceiling, which hopefully you guys aren't going into any drop ceilings. But if you are, it's full of dust. It is the easy, one of the easiest places to find rodent activity if you're working inside a building, if there's a, a nice drop ceiling. Uh, take your flashlight, shine it on the pipe runs, and there should be a layer of dust on the pipe runs. If you shine a light on those pipes and it, they shine back at you, that should tell you that something's active in the ceiling because it's walking the pipes and knocking the dust down. Uh, so I do that a lot in buildings when I'm up in the ceilings. I look to see where I'm getting reflections back on the pipes. And when I do, I go pop those ceiling tiles. And a majority of the time when I look, uh, there are tracks on it or, or tail drags or there's some droppings beneath that spot. But guys, I hope everybody's been staring at this picture while I've been uh, rambling because you should notice, look at my finger for scale on the size of that track. If that's a rat track, I quit. Guys, that track is gigantic. So this is why we do good inspections and why good inspections and paying attention to detail is so important. We were called on this, and this was inside a building, and they said, uh, it sounds like the rats above us are bowling. Uh, they're just making noise everywhere. So I go up in the ceiling and look, and I find this. That is a raccoon track, not a rat trap. If we'd have put rat traps out and bait stations and all this and treated it as if it was a rodent, we'd have been there for God knows how long, because we never caught the raccoon and the bowling would have continued. Instead, we found this and we were able to put out the correct size traps and uh, seal the building hole that was large enough for the raccoon to get in. And we were able to eliminate the problem. Otherwise, we'd have just been spinning our wheels. So another reason for good inspections is to make sure we identify the proper pest. Hopefully, you guys don't run into too many raccoons and possums in kitchens. Although, speaking from experience, I've now cleaned two, kitchen, uh, two possums out of restaurant kitchens at this point. Yeah, possums out of kitchens, insane. Uh, sand, guys, when we're walking around outside of buildings, we have this great soil down here on the Gulf Coast. It's a fine alluvial soil, and it's very sandy. Uh, so if there's no grass growing and it's just finished raining, and this works too, guys. Even in big cities, if you're in an area, uh, construction areas are just – I look down at the gutter sometimes because we have all that uh, dirt and grime and sometimes mud that gets washed in our gutters by our storm drains. You can look in that and find these tracks and know where you have activity at. It's about, like I said, this is small detail work. It's going to require you to get on your hands and knees and go, is that just a divot in the sand or is that a track? Uh, but, you know, good work is, is detail work. Uh, sand, too, just spilled randomly. And, guys, when we're doing kitchen inspections, it's not going to be sand spilled randomly. What's it going to be? It's going to be flour or sugar or something like that. These are great places to look for tracks, too. I was doing a kitchen inspection years and years and years ago. I believe Claudia was on this one with me too. And it was flour in a kitchen uh, and the rats were tracking it. And we were able to track the rats back to the storeroom where sadly the people had plastic bins. They were storing the flour in, but they weren't putting the lids on the bins. So the rats were more than able to get in there and they were rolling around in a flour, eating it, defecating, urinating. And what's worse is um, so one of the cooks comes in and gets a big scoop of this flour and I'm like, sir, there's droppings in there. Rodents have been in there. Oh, it's not that bad. And he goes in the kitchen to cook with this. It's not that bad. The whole container should have been empty, cleaned, if not thrown away by that point. But enough of my tirade, guys. This is something we should pay more attention to. Flour, sugar, things like that that get spilled will leave us evidence. But it's also for a mouse. My God, you, you're leaving a, a five-store meal sometimes with just little tiny spills because they require so so little food to get uh, to stay alive and to get their nutrition. Uh, you know, rats require a little more, but we need to clean up our spills. But also use them to your advantage. You know, try and find tracks in them. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, losing my voice a little bit. Okay, pre-baiting, we'll skip through this too because this definitely pertains more to pest control guys, but I'll just mention it briefly because, hey, take this home to your house, use it at home too. It's great information. Uh, and you're probably wondering why a lot of these rodents don't go in the traps or don't go in the glue boards, right? Because uh, you guys see this on inspections. You see, you probably go into restaurants and in kitchens and see places where the pest control guy is going above and beyond tried everything humanly possible to eliminate the rodent issue, but it's still occurring. Well, a lot of times that's because of trap shyness. Uh, it's because 
especially working in a city that's 300 years old. I'm aware when I get to a site, I'm probably not the first person who's tried to catch this rodent, which means he's probably learned what a trap is and what a glue board is and learned to avoid them. So that's why we do pre-baiting. If anybody here hunts or something like that, it's a very similar principle uh, of uh, putting out feeders, basically, where we're putting out traps not set to kill, but putting uh, food in them. So the animal learns that that trap is their best friend. And once the animals have been trained that, that now the traps won't hurt them, that's when we fool them. It usually takes about three or four days of pre-baiting. Then we set our traps to kill. We come back and instead of catching one or two mice or rats randomly, we can clean out entire families at once. So it's a very effective method. And if you see pest control guys doing this, this also explains why they have traps out with bait in them, but they're not set to kill. It's because they realize they're dealing with trap shy rodents and that's how they're trying to, to uh, overcome this problem. Uh, like I said, that's about all we're gonna gripe on with this because now on to something. Hey, everybody. Uh, can everybody can please mute? Your, yeah, please mute your lines. Thank <clears> you. <throat> okay, guys, now on to the real fun parts because now we're really dealing with stuff you guys get into deep cleaning. So everybody here is a sanitarian should know exactly what they're looking at in the left hand picture, right? That is a trap on an industrial dishwasher. I could probably take this picture at almost any restaurant I go to in the city because uh, this is so common. Back when I did private sector, every restaurant I went to, I saw this. Uh, and guys, look at it. We have, uh, I like that. There's American cockroach in there. There's French fries. There's bits of crawfish shell and shrimp peelings. Uh, it's, a, it's a buffet for rats. And we're looking even closer, right? Because remember, it's detail work. <clears throat> look at those pipes. You can see the top of the white lines and how they they have that gunk on them. But when we look at the, the gray line running into the actual catch pan there, excuse me, that brown and that black grime there, that's that's not caused from the dishwasher. That's caused from the rat that lives in the dishwasher. Because in this situation, I won't say where this was, but I worked here for a while on this problem. The rat never left the dishwasher. This was his house. He got his fresh water delivered every day. Uh, by the dishwasher, he chewed a little line. It had just enough water dripping out so he could drink fresh water whenever he wanted, and food was delivered to him every night because this pan was never cleaned. The rat cleaned it for them. Uh, but that sebum on that line where the rat would come out and just sit on the line and wait for whatever he wanted and pick it out bit by bit, this, these things need to be cleaned out every day. As is evidenced by the American cockroach in the picture, it also causes roach issues. So, you know, they're just feeding machines in restaurants and they get overlooked so many times. Uh, and it should be emptied multiple times a day because that's something else. Uh, rodents will adapt. They will figure out that, hey, they're emptying this thing uh, every night when they finish. Maybe I, should, maybe I should become active about two, three hours before they close instead when the food's still present. And they'll learn to ignore us. Even though they're naturally afraid of humans, they will learn to totally ignore our presence if that means that they get an opportunity, ch an opportune chance to feed. Uh, and guys, that if the dumpster area of your restaurant looks like the picture on the right, of course you're going to have rodent issues. You're also going to have fly issues. You're also going to have roach issues, probably ants and other things too. So it's not just about cleaning of the kitchen. And when we say deep cleaning, we're not just talking about wiping everything down, every surface with a bleach cloth, okay? No, like I said, it's about getting on, getting their staff getting on hands and knees and getting behind that back leg on that prep table against the wall where it's tough to reach. It's about cleaning this disgusting uh, catch pan right here. It's about scrubbing down stoves and uh, fryers and things where you get overflow sometimes so the sides get covered in grease. Well, guess what? At night, those rats and mice will come out and they'll lick the grease off of those uh, off those grease traps or off those deep fryers. Everything needs to be cleaned regularly. And when I say regularly, that's not yearly, that's not every six months. I'd advise daily, if not weekly, if not monthly. You know, the more frequently you can clean, the less problems you're gonna have. Because remember what I said in the very beginning, right? The key to pest control, much less rodent control, is sanitation. Uh, and can we ever expect to get control of a situation when these are the things we're dealing with? I mean, if your dumpster area looks like that, you. You're going to have so many issues to deal with. And guys, it takes, they have to go out and pressure wash, not just the dumpster area, not just get all the garbage from under it, but the dumpster itself needs to be cleaned. Uh, and sometimes pressure washing alone is not enough. Sometimes chemical cleaners need to be used too. Because remember, we're trying to remove pathogens and pheromone markers these animals left behind. So just water isn't strong enough to get that job done. 
Okay, and I love this. I start with my uh, sanitation is key. Once again, I need to rearrange this presentation and make this first. But okay, everything needs to be sweeped and mopped. Heavy equipment, if it needs to be moved, it needs to be moved. There's no such thing as, well, we can't do that. It's impossible. Well, you got the equipment in here to begin with, so obviously it's possible. I mean, I understand some things are bolted down. Well, then a method or a methodology has to be developed so that cleaning can be accomplished. These things should be thought through before the restaurant even opens, but no one thinks of pest control until they're trying to control a pest. You know, no, very little forethought is given to this, uh, which is a shame. We really should be considered one of the primary things in building instruction should be uh, exclusion of pests. But yeah, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, all appliances clean, like I said, inside and out. Uh, we recently, I need to include, uh, that one's getting added to the, one of my presentations. Okay, guys, I was recently at a building, and when I say recently, this was last week, I believe. Uh, it was Ford flies. It wasn't rodents, and they were everywhere in the building. And the people, they listened to us the first time because uh, we went out there, did an inspection. We found numerous issues. They had a vending machine. It was spilling uh, colas all over, like uh, the, the drinks were breaking in the machine. And so, uh, so all that syrupy soda juice was coming down underneath and just pooling. And that was one of their issues. And they had trash cans where, yes, the trash was being removed every day, but you were getting holes in the bag. So that garbage juice was leaking out and they'd have almost a half inch of garbage juice in some of these trash cans at the bottom where it was perfect habitat to breed Ford flies. So they called us back and they were like, we cleaned everything you said and we still have a fly issue. So I go out there to look and yeah, they cleaned everything perfectly. And then the woman goes, I think I found the issue. And she opens the refrigerator and holy cow. Uh, and I'm not even exaggerating. I say hundreds of dead Ford flies at the bottom of the fridge, but not just that. When she opened it, uh, hundreds of live Ford flies came out of the fridge as well. Uh, and I look at the woman and the smell of the fridge, it's, it smelled like rancid cat box mixed with uh, vomit or something. It was just horrifying. And I, uh, I've got a pretty strong constitution for bad smells. I was gagging. And I told her, I can fix your problem right now. I can clean out this for you. Well, you can't do that. That's people's lunches. Okay, that's what we mean by uh, appliances have to be cleaned out both inside and out. Just wiping down the outside the fridge wasn't enough. Sure, those were some of those people's uh, lunches might not have been rancid, but at least one or two were. And would you want to eat your lunch after all those Ford flies have been landing on? And they go, oh, well, how can flies breed in that refrigerator? Ford flies are pretty amazing. They were, they were getting it done. Uh, refrigerator wasn't cold enough for one thing, obviously because of the food spoilage, but also it needs to be emptied regularly. So guys, appliances inside and out. That goes for stoves too, because we have often when we're cooking things inside of stoves overflow too, that leaves food residue behind that little things can get in. Because remember too, I said uh, rodents will feed on cockroaches. So if you get a bad American cockroach issue, those roaches will go in those uh, ovens and other appliances when they're turned off, mind you. Now when they're turned on, uh, and they will go feed on that, and then they become a food source for the rodents. So uh, it's about building a whole, uh, looking at it from a, every point of view on this. You know, everything ties to each other in some way when we're doing rodent work. Okay, signs of activity. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Ray brought this up uh, to eliminate those pheromone markers. Clean it with uh, sometimes industrial cleaners are necessary. Okay, conducive conditions. And mind you, this uh, this could be anywhere. This this picture. This wasn't at a restaurant, but this could be behind a restaurant or whatever. That's cat food in one bowl and cat water in another. And that's actually, I should say, that's rat food in one bowl and rat water in another. Because this restaurant was trying to use cats to control its rodent population, but yet putting out food and water every night for the feral cats that hung out around the dumpster to try and encourage more feral cats to hang out around the dumpster. This became a rodent breeding machine because first, fed cats don't hunt. Second, cats are not an effective method of rodent elimination, guys, especially with adult rats. Even a big cat doesn't, even a big house cat doesn't want to take on an adult Norway rat. It's not going to be a fun fight. They probably would win, but then again, Norway rats are tough. Uh, now, mind you, they'll pick off the weak individuals and the juveniles and they'll hit mice here and there, but not nearly enough to be effective as rodent control. So, guys, yeah. Cats are awesome. I have some at home, but I don't keep them for rodent control issues. I keep them because cats are awesome. Uh, but guys, if you see things like this around your restaurant where, uh, and it doesn't have to just be cat food. A lot of restaurants I see, 
They'll take leftovers and instead of throwing them in a dumpster of leftover food, they'll throw it in the yard or the property around them to feed the pigeons I've heard, to feed stray dogs or stray cats. Uh, all they're doing is feeding rats. Uh, and I'll touch on a sensitive subject just briefly. I've seen people, especially in, uh, in New Orleans, leave food out for homeless. And I'm not anti-feeding the homeless at all, guys. It's a tough spot. But I am anti-leaving boxes of food out behind the back door of your business for people who may or may not come to get the food. Because in that situation, the rats were eating the food before anyone could come and collect it. So if you're going to do something like that, have a schedule set out. You know, where you're only doing it at certain times or even this, you only give it directly to people. You don't leave food out on the ground hoping a homeless person will come and find it and eat. If someone walks by at the end of your shift and you want to feed them, that's awesome. You're an amazing person. If you want to leave the food on the ground, you might as well feed it directly to the rat. It's it's not it, it's not accomplishing anything, guys. So that's one of the conducive condition things like that. Also, just dirty k kitchens in general. And uh, composting can be an issue if you're one of the new modern new wave kitchen areas that you're inspecting. I've seen now where people are making in their back uh, patio areas or in the garbage areas actually mini composters. Uh, if composting isn't done correctly, it becomes a rat beacon. If it's done correctly, it still can be an issue at times. So hopefully no one's run into that if I've seen them once now. Okay, other conditions, conditions I see. This is a gas station restaurant's garbage disposal exit. I say garbage disposal. This lead led from the sink in their kitchen outside. Guys, see all that gunk in there? Uh, I think I get, no, I didn't. Uh, I pulled the photo because I do a close up of what's in the gunk and it's almost enough to make one vomit because it's like bits of chicken and they were cooking gum. They dumped gumbo out of it. So uh, it was just disgusting, the stuff that came out of this. But yeah, I'm walking and it's funny. I was doing a citizen inspection and I happened to be walking by this little bodega and all of a sudden I hear gurgle and the smell enough. I was already brought up by the smell because I could smell rats. But oh man, this this food and water just starts pouring out the strain. And you see from the stain on the sidewalk, this is not the first time this has happened. This is a regular occurrence that food comes pouring out of the strain every day. Well, look at this. Okay, it's not just the toilet there. If you look, because uh, that's nothing at all. I, I don't think it was functioning. Uh, see the pipe coming out of the wall right here where my cursor is going. Follow it down to this gutter, to the drain, and that's where our rats were. They were waiting every day in the storm drain for that lunch rush or that hour after lunch when they rinsed their pots and pans out. Oh, sorry. And that food would come down, wash, hit the gutter, and then wash over to the to, the, to our rats in our storm drains. This They were creating their own perfect storm. Uh, thank you to the sanitarians who worked with us on this because uh, this was fixed immediately, actually. I was shocked at how quick this place fixed this. So I can't go back and take this picture again. Uh, but sadly, this is very common to a lot. Like I said earlier, a lot of people's drains don't actually hook up to plumbing sometimes. Uh, don't know why, but they're creating little rodent feeding stations in places. So this is something our inspections we need to pay attention to. Okay, other conducive conditions that we see, of course, garbage. We dance around this one a lot today. Um, proper sanitation is key and proper garbage storage is key. Uh, there's a restaurant I'm currently dealing with downtown where they've got beautiful dumpsters with locks on them and everything so that to keep people from opening them up because that's one of our issues is almost people coming to forage and opening the cans and then they leave them open so the rats can get in. Well, I told them the locks are awesome, but I've never seen them locked. They leave the cans unlocked all day. So guess what? The cans are open all day because people are the cans, which means rats are coming to forage right inside the people. Uh, this is going to lead to one day an outbreak of some horrible disease from people eating on the side of rats. But guys, it's it's trying to make it. I'm not saying that the rats won't be able to figure out a way in a dumpster. They will eventually. It's about limiting that because they'd rather not figure it out. They'd rather go to that bait station and eat bait or go to that snap trap. If if they couldn't get in that can, they would go somewhere else to look for food. If they couldn't find food, then they'd come back and chew a hole in it in the top of the dumpster to get in. Uh, and there's more to dumpsters. Dumpster plugs are key to guys. Uh, here in New Orleans, almost every dumpster I come across doesn't have a plug present. And I know why. Uh, it's because of all the rain, they fill with water and over, otherwise they'd overflow. But that dumpster plug is the perfect diameter for a rat to fit through the hole and get in the dumpster. So even if you have it sealed and locked properly, they'll go straight in that dumpster plug hole. So these are things to look for uh, on your inspections to see if that's a reason why that you're still getting rodent issues is because trash is being improperly stored or not correctly uh, put away. 
oh, Caduce Conditions, isn't this a beautiful picture? Uh, there's a whole video that goes with this. If anybody knows it, this has been fixed, though. I will say, uh, actually, not last year, two years ago now, because COVID makes us forget that we lost a year. Uh, two years ago, I went and checked on the site, and it, it's there's still a, uh, maybe two or three boroughs because they are next to a fast food place, which will remain nameless, and a, a major box store, which will remain nameless. But they create a perfect storm. You had the dumpsters from a fast food place right there on one corner. And the only thing that kept the dumpster secure was a brick wall with no top on it. Come on, guys, the rats can climb up that wall like a lizard or a squirrel and go right over it. So that was no problem. And then you had the box stars dumpster on the other side. And here you can tell it's a canal bank. So it's a, a large ditch or canal bank where there's water almost year round. So the rodents had fresh water. They're getting fast food delivered every day. They're getting box store garbage, which included, you know, every type of food item imaginable. And there was one other key, which you can't tell from the picture, but there was a feral cat colony nearby where people were, were feeding cats every day, or they thought they were feeding cats every day. Guys, with that amount of holes, that's like third world level rats. That's like New York level rats. That's it's just it's extreme. Uh, and how do they solve the problem? They ended up, uh, they moved the trash cans for the box store to the other side of the store to keep that away. Uh, the fast food place, uh, the dumpsters are still there, but they got uh, road resistant dumpsters actually. They're all functioning properly. The people who are feeding the cats, they were informed to stop feeding the cats and they did. And then a lot of rodenticide was used and this issue was brought down to manageable. It took them years, guys, uh, to get this situation under control because and it did, the mess up thing is it didn't take years for the situation to get out of control. A situation like this can occur in a few months because, as Claudia discussed in the biology section, these guys are amazing breeders and they're density breeders, which means a lot of food and very few predators means you're going to get higher birth rates, higher numbers of rats. So things we're looking for. If you see those dumpsters and you see feral cat feeding and then all these things are playing in. Remember how I started with this presentation saying we're looking for details. We're going to be detectives and all these clues are going to lead us to show us where our problems are and how to solve them. So and with that, we'll wrap up a little bit. And I love it because a picture does say a thousand words. And guys, that is a beautiful little Norway female from the French Quarter. And this picture should tell you a lot because look behind her as daylight. Uh, she was out in the middle of the day, which is very uncommon for these guys. They're nocturnal, right? They want to hide at night. When you see rats during the day, that should tell you a couple things. The possibilities are uh, you could have a large population, one so big that these animals are required now to come out during the day because there's so many animals foraging at night, there's just no, no more opportunities. Or uh, it could be that they were on a schedule and the trash was coming out every night. And now instead they're putting the trash out in the mornings or during the day. So the rat has learned that the food's only available at certain times. So it's coming out during the day because that's the only chance to eat. Or the third likely reason is rodenticide poisoning. Uh, a lot of times when these animals are sick, uh, be it from a natural occurring disease or from poisoning, they get pushed out the colony because the other animals realize that they're sick and don't want them around. So we'll find these animals out during the day because they have nowhere else to go. Uh, so yeah, that'll sum it up and hopefully, uh, I got some good questions coming my way and I put us back on schedule. Nice. <laughs> so, um, there is a question. Is there a way to know if a rat has been poisoned? Can they be eaten or do they, they care <laughs> not killed by heat? Okay. Is there a way to know if they've been poisoned? Uh, Yes and no. Okay, short of cutting the animal open, that's the only real way to know if it's a dead animal, if it's alive. Uh, the droppings, the coloration of the droppings should be changed based on its diet. And a lot of the rodenticides we use have uh, specific dyes in them. So uh, those dyes, if you're finding red droppings or something like that, or blue droppings, uh, see if you can talk to the pest control guy and see what bait he's using. And that should tell you whether that's from rodenticides because they can eat other things that'll dye their droppings too. Uh, like I said, they, the mice that eat ivory soap a lot or eat candles, uh, their droppings will go pure white. Uh, I've seen them eating toothpaste rats where they put white droppings. So it's weird the things that'll change coloration. But other than that, cutting the animal open or that, uh, sometimes they act, we will call it, they act drunk, quote unquote, where the animals will come out and run in circles or run into the wall. Uh, that's usually a good sign too. But other than those, not really. Uh, and I know there's a little more on that question, right? 
what was the rest of the question, Janet? There is. It's about eating um, the rodent. And actually, I'm going to address yeah, that. No, Jimmy. I was just going to say, don't eat rodents. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> squirrels, delicious. <laughs> commensal rodents, don't eat commensal rodents in America. <laughs> there are certain countries that will serve them to you, commensal rodents, and those are wild caught. So I might think different. But no, I would not eat anything I caught in any business ever. All right. Timmy, that was excellent. Really great. Um, can everybody see my screen? Can you see my screen, Janet? Yes, ma'am. Is it just a presentation or did you see the sidebar as well? Just a presentation. Excellent. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Look, I wanted to thank everybody. I looked at the survey, 78 responses. This is so awesome. So I really appreciate it. If you've not done the survey, take a couple minutes, you know, and do it for us. That would be so great. I mean, this is really just wonderful information that we're going to receive from all of you. So um, now you know what to look for, how to look for it, and you know, just these, all these nooks and crannies of where they might be. And I'm going to tell you now about the implication, right, of having rodents uh, in and around that property. So I will get on my soapbox for about 15 seconds. And that really is all about the importance of rodents. Okay. I think, unfortunately, it, a lot of people, it's not just to our region. I think it is nationally, in some cases, even internationally, you know, well, you know, I see a mouse, I see a rat, I guess that's part of it. Look, I live in New Orleans. I'm going to see that. It's hot. There's a lot of visitors. Absolutely bad, at, wrong attitude. That is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to have rodents in a house, in a structure, in a restaurant, not even one, not in a school. It is just not acceptable, right? And there are things that we all can do you know, that you've been listening to already on how to keep these animals out and managed. So I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about history. And the reason why I have the Pied Piper here, right? goes back to medieval, medieval ages, but look, I mean, if you, when it comes to vector control, rodents and mosquitoes and history, if you like that topic, there's so much interesting stuff to read about, especially with plague, you know, in the 1300s killing half the population of, of Europe, medieval Europe. That's insane, right? And so we always have to go back in history and look at how things were done so that we hopefully don't repeat them again. But the reality is, all right, I don't know any city in the United States that is truly prepared for a rodent born disease outbreak. And that is a problem. Okay, so this is kind of why, you know, we're doing this as well. So let's just give, a, again, a little bit of information uh, why these animals are so important. So I'm going to be talking about disease and sort of that also implication of that urban pest problem. So what makes rodents good disease agent? You know, now we're, we're here primarily talking about commensal rodents, so those are three species. But there are other rodents that are very, very important for disease. If you're in Africa with loss of virus, I mean, there's, there's a bunch. But let's just talk about it as a big picture. So there's a lot of diversity in the rodent world. They are often very opportunistic. They have that high reproduction potential. They can achieve very high population densities. And then they're also peridomestic. So they're living in and around our you know, facilities and structures. So we already know this, right? They're the largest uh, mammal group. They're also uh, very adaptable. And then the reality is they've been living with us for you know, thousands of years. Um, and so um, they've been around us. Now, I think we have to get back to the basics and understand a few things when it comes to um, just animals and disease. And the term really is called um, zoonosis, which is a zoonotic disease, right? So zoonotic diseases are caused by infections that are shared between animals and people. So if you look at that nice graph from the CDC, it can be all kinds of, it can be your dog, it can be your cat, right? Um, it can be a deer or a bat or a mouse or a rat. Uh, a mountain lion, a bat, you name it. 
um, it can be any of those animals that that disease is going to be shared uh, with people. Okay, so very important. So that's a very generic, a uh, big disease. So let's look at an example here. So a zoonotic virus. Okay, so there's lots of different um, pathogens in rodents. And so we'll just select one as a virus, um, are transmissible. And often we think about, even from a mosquito standpoint, right, an arthropod, which is an arbovirus. Um, but basically those viruses are gonna be transmissible from that animal to a person. Um, and it can be transmitted by uh, infected, uh, let's say if you're an arthropod, you're probably gonna bite, uh, but it can be a scratch. It can be um, through even, uh, a pathogen, for example, that is in there, like a, a flea, which is your vector. And so you've got your rat, your vector, and you've got a pathogen. And it's that disease is cycling around. And guess what? We just happen to be in the way and that flea bites us because uh, we're working, let's say in an area that has rats, that has fleas, uh, potentially has a pathogen, and we happen to have a flea or two land on us and, and take a bite, okay? That might be a problem and that might be the beginning of a disease cycle uh, with that. So uh, pretty important. When you think about, <laughs> often I think, you know, for all of us here, we're talking a lot about um, arboviral transmission, right? So you've got that arthropod that's involved and the mosquito is the big one that of course we always worry about and, and frankly gets a whole lot more press you know, than any of these rodent-borne diseases that I'm gonna mention here in a minute. But think about chikungunya and think about Zika virus in 2016. I mean, that was absolute national and global news, right? Uh, for the entire year. And um, so typically you've got a sylvatic cycle, which is gonna be sort of that wild cycle. You've got a vertebrate host, which might be a monkey. Um, and you've got that vector and that, that is cycling through and then all of a sudden that mosquito bites that human, it can actually replicate and, and there you go. So now you've got that cycle that's jumped into the human population. And so when we think about, um, you know, different types of vectors, it can be mosquitoes and flies are a big one, ticks, really a big issue, even kissing bugs and mites and lice and fleas. Um, so those are your sort of um, arthropod, but then rats and mice, raccoons, bats. So there's a lot of also mammal uh, squirrels. I mean, there's all kinds of different ones. So when, let's talk about just really rodents, okay? And I'm really, you know, this particular case, the commensal rodents, um, you know, how does transmission occur between animals and people? And so I sort of wanna see if rats check the box on any of these. And so there are four major ways. One's gonna be through direct contact, indirect contact, uh, vector-borne, and even food-borne, right? Eating or drinking something unsafe. Um, and that might be even contaminated with animal feces. Salmonella, for example, is a good example. So when we think about our rats and mice, hey, look, direct contact, coming in contact with saliva, blood, urine, mucus, feces, or other body fluids of an infected animal. Well, rats check that box. Um, earlier this year, we had a situation in New Orleans where um, there was a, a, a person that was scratched um, by a rat. And uh, fortunately, this person ended up, you know, going to the, to the physician and they had to do, he didn't get sick and no like health outcomes, but, you know, he knew that he needed to go to the physician and they had to evaluate him and they ended up putting the person on some antibiotics as a preventative measure uh, because some of the bacterial uh, pathogens that are there. So that definitely can happen. Um, how about coming into indirect contact, right? Where these animals live in Rome? Well, yeah, rats, you can check that box as well, right? In examples would be um, coming into contact with uh, contaminated, uh, animal play, like urine and feces and even possibly the soil um, that may have, uh, you know, urine or feces in it. So yes. Um, also vector borne, right? Being bit by a tick or an insect like flea or uh, mosquito. So we've got, we know that our animals here in our metropolitan area, especially Orleans Parish, um, some have fleas, oriental rat fleas, not across the entire city, but in locations, uh, but we do have two different species of mites 
uh, that are relatively common. That is the, ecto, the, the ectoparasite group that's more common in New Orleans. And then of course, foodborne, right? And so that's very important as it relates to um, salmonella and some other diseases. So the way I sort of think about, you know, um, openings, structural openings and buildings and allowing rodents to come in would be, let's say it's a nori rat situation. You've got that nori rat that is in the sewer. It's found a break, right? It's got all kinds of things on it. Uh, and then potentially well, goes out of the sewer onto the soils, onto the uh, surface of the street makes its way into a building behind the kitchen, okay? And it goes to the ice maker that might have a shelf that is, has a bunch of glasses on it and it's walking around that area contaminating, right? So, you know, that's a really huge issue that maybe we don't necessarily think about, but could be a potential problem. And so, you know, that patron of that restaurant goes and has a nice dinner, you know, everything's beautiful, but they go home and they're just not feeling very well, you know, after a short period of time. And then they probably just blame it to some sort of food poisoning, possibly. Well, well, maybe it's that rat, you know, that's been rubbing its fur and feet everywhere around those glasses where they just used it to drink, right? So that, that's kind of how we think, I think, and I think everyone needs to really, you know, understand sort of that potential, right? That that's going to happen. And, and most people go to the doctor, they're not gonna say, oh, I definitely have a rodent-borne disease. Can you make sure you check me? No one thinks that, right? But we wanna make sure we're doing all of our job correctly so that we're preventing any of these things from occurring. Okay, now when we think about a whole other group of problems it would be allergies, right? So what's an allergy, right? It's an overreaction of the immune system to a substance that um, generally don't affect other people. So some people are, are very much allergic to mouse proteins um, and it can cause really serious issues in some cases. Some people have no reaction, but many, many people do. And so some symptoms would be sneezing and coughing, itching, get hives. Uh, for very chronic conditions, sin uh, sinusitis, I think it's called, and then um, also asthma um, can really trigger asthma issues. And these reactions can be from very mild to life-threatening, okay? And of course, we're talking about rodents today. Cockroaches will probably be the next big one, uh, but some people are allergic to dust mites, even mosquitoes and ticks. I mean, there's some people that get huge welts, right, with mosquitoes but those are just some examples. So there's a nice paper. You can look at the bot. If you want more information about the study, you're welcome to go and um, look up that particular paper. But what they did was um, they looked at some inner city schools and they looked at the uh, incidence of um, asthma. So we're looking at the days of, uh, uh, of a, a child with symptoms from asthma and then they also looked at the level of mouse allergens in that space. And so guess what happens here? Uh, you have more sim symptomatic days with higher you know, uh, micrograms of, uh, of mouse allergens in that space. And then also really disturbing is that the lung function uh, of these uh, children also decreases uh, with uh, exposure with the higher amounts of allergen. So, you know, this is real. And our goal here in schools, right, is to have a safe environment, but also keep those kids in school uh, to learn. We don't want them at home, um, you know, not learning. So very important. Now, when we look at sort of the big urban rodent situation and problems, you have contamination of food, which, you know, Timmy's touched on already. You can have destruction of damage to property that can be gnawing that I talked about earlier. I've seen sidewalks go down, uh, crack, I mean, uh, uh, structural openings in buildings, all kinds of things, disease transmission, um, possible increase in asthma, especially children. And look, it just doesn't look nice for a city to be known for having rodents, you know? So New Orleans, our metropolitan area, other places in Texas as well, if it's Galveston and um, other places, they're you know very much a touristic uh, type city. And I don't want anybody going home saying, oh, in New Orleans, I went to a restaurant and wow, there was a rat that ran across the, the room. That's not what we want, right? We wanna make sure that we're all working together um, so those types of things don't happen. Now, when you, here's a nice picture of New Orleans, sort of an aerial view. <laughs> and 
you know, there are a lot of different reasons um, for, uh, you know, people coming into cities, people tend to keep coming into cities and uh, population density is very important when it relates to rodents um, on, you know, population density of people, I should say, and sort of urbanization. So we're going to talk a little bit about this and some of the contributing factors could be, and it's not necessarily all specific to New Orleans, but this is sort of in the generic way. You'll have to look at your own, uh, uh, you know, area that you live in. But, you know, that sylvatic frontier, you know, we tend to keep encroaching right on green space and um, just building and uh, population growth, of course, of cities. So a lot of times uh, higher density um, matters uh, as it relates to rodents um, of people. Uh, urbanization, lack of infrastructure. Sometimes cities are built very quickly. Uh, and even in some of the metropolitan areas, if you look at St. Tammany Parish, which is just north of New Orleans, um, many people, many of the houses are on septic tanks and they have ditches, right? And so some of that water um, that's processed through the septic tanks are gonna go overflow or gonna go into the ditches. And so that causes a whole lot of issues for mosquitoes, uh, but that happens to be an example. Um, also, uh, uh, increasing poverty, poor hygiene levels um, is very important as well. Access to health services, depending on where you are in the world or country. Resistance to pesticides. We don't have a good handle uh, here in New Orleans on rodenticide resistance, but we are walking down that path of having the capacity uh, to look at um, you know, resistant genes in our population. So hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have a much better idea and then I appreciate the 196 people that are on this call uh, because we're increasing our expertise, right? In training and vector control and particularly in rodent control. And look, lack of public participation, uh, this is a big deal. And so we need, it's teamwork when it comes to rodents and really vectors in general, but really especially for rodents, we need people to do the right things of putting the lid on the garbage can and, you know, keeping uh, those uh, water drips uh, dry, et cetera, et cetera. So very important. Um, if you can uh, please put yourself on mute, that'd be great. So new construction, right? So we need new construction to be uh, built in a way that is pretty tight on the front end. And actually I've been looking at all of the ordinances at the city of New Orleans and the city of New Orleans has that specifically. Uh, for uh, rodent control in that a tight structure. So no gaps and all of that during construction. So, you know, we're gonna be moving on that as well. And of course, climate change, uh, increasing temperature. So that's important. So we talked about how uh, roof rats are typically around the periphery of the country, but what if it starts to get really warm in Memphis and, you know, further north? Is that gonna provide the habitat um, conditions for roof rats? So we've seen this already, so I'm gonna kind of skip it, but um, you can see these are really great photographs of just, again, I, we really wanna hammer home so that you understand the two species that we have in our regions and um, you need to be able to identify them so that you can do the right thing as far as control. All right, here's the house mouse. We talked a lot about that, but these are not commensal rodents, right? But they're still very important rodents, particularly the deer mouse, in the white-footed mouse, right? So there's a lot of implications in some parts of the re of the country, especially with the deer mouse with hantavirus, um, but they can cause a lot of problems um, in different parts of the country. Um, my family, I grew up outside of Chicago and uh, the white-footed mouse is a huge problem in basements, for example. They're very crafty and able to get in. Now, all of you are here today. I'm sorry we can't be in person. You know, it's just the nature of, of the situation. But what it does do, these online, you know, opportunities is able to bring in people who can't travel, for example, right? So it's not the best solution, but it is actually a, a very good solution to get everybody in. So the better we do at training decision makers, a little bit older photo, but that's Mitch Landrew, our, our former mayor. Um, I also talk a lot with our current mayor and our administrators about rodents and how important they are. We also do uh, work with community health uh, workers and try to reach the public. It is very time consuming, laborious, um, but we also take a big step in training professionals. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more of that in our outreach. 
And again, I mean, we want to talk about sanitation and all of these things, which we have touched on. But if you look at the sort of the big scale of a city, these are two cities, right? You've got Paris and then you have Dublin. And look at the absolutely 180 degree difference in how trash is handled. And so it is no surprise, right, that in Dublin, you're just not seeing rats run around because you've got small, you've got closed garbage cans, rat, you know, tamper, I guess, rat tamper proof uh, garbage cans. Whereas in Paris, most of those open garbage cans are just these little skinny pieces of plastic. So very accessible. So I just thought this was a great example. We are doing some garbage cans in New Orleans that are closed. But when you look at lack of public participation, you know, this happens to be a bodega, you know, um, in New Orleans, and actually I ended up calling our state sanitary and lead for our region, and, and she got on it right away. But this is just so many problems, you know, from mosquitoes um, all the way to rodents. And of course, you know, we're vector control, so we do mosquitoes as well, and it's all tied together from food and water sources um, for both of these types of organisms. You know, when you think about construction practices, right? So this is so important. It is um, just building things out to begin with. Uh, pest control is typically an afterthought, you know, when there's a problem. And pest control needs to be on the front end of things every single time so that you don't have those infestations. You're not creating your own problems, right? And that's what we tend to do. So here's some hollow block. Think about an opening that goes into here. Each one of these will be a little house, right? A little nest, nesting area for a rat. And very common are those doors that have gaps underneath and plumbing penetrations and even the space between these doors. These animals will walk right on in. We talked, I briefly touched on resistance. We don't have a good handle uh, in our region, which we hope to change. Uh, but there's a publication, you can look it up, where they did some surveys in the Netherlands of um, what the PMPs, the pest management professionals, thought that they were seeing resistance to what was actually confirmed um, looking at the mutation. So there's a little bit dirt, actually more widespread, right, uh, than that was even thought by the PMP survey. All right, so let's get to the good stuff, right? So now let's get to the disease aspect. So somebody asked the question about, you know, would you eat, can you eat uh, a rat? So I'm going to, I'm going to be on Timmy's team here and say, I wouldn't eat a rat. Um, but most of these um, are going to, can be killed uh, with high heat or an autoclave, for example. Uh, but who knows what else is in those animals. So I would never just cook them and eat them. Okay. Now, not every one of these diseases are going to be, our pathogens are going to be in our region. But you can go to the Centers for Disease Control. This is where this was taken, taken. And you can see globally that there are a lot of different uh, uh, um, diseases. And so it's important for any city, you know, we fall under Homeland Security. So I am always thinking about preparedness, right? What's next coming in? Something else is going to come in. So you have to know what is happening around us globally so that we can track and see if there is a new disease um, that finds its way to our region, how are we going to respond? Now, there are also indirect diseases that are spread indirectly by ticks and fleas, um, snails, mites, um, you know, that might be associated with rodents. And so pretty important there as well. So we're gonna go through some examples. And um, this came out of the newspaper, this is 2017. Uh, there were three cases of leptospirosis. I believe this was in Manhattan. Two people uh, uh, were very sick and one person died. And this was in an apartment complex, like a high rise. All right. So this should have made absolute national news um, because this is a huge concern. Um, if you can think about a high rise and how complex, because each building is essentially a city, right? With wiring and gaps and underground and um, all these different apartments. And so it's just really a complex uh, situation. Also another one, I don't know if you all remember, but this is a, a while back, almost uh, what, uh, almost 10 years, but it was in Yosemite National Park. And so a lot, they have villages and little bungalows, cabins that you can stay in. And seven people uh, became sick and three people died um, of Hanta pulmonary virus. 
And that's just unacceptable, right? And so clearly there was contamination, a virus, and that's a lot of people that were potentially exposed um, to that particular disease. This was tragic as well. So this was in Georgia. Um, I believe this was at a peanut butter farm, excuse me, a peanut butter factory in 2009. Um, and Salmonella was able to get in uh, and peripherate through the peanut butter in the facility. And there were just so many different issues with it, but ultimately nine people died. Um, 700 people were sick. And it affected uh, 42 different states and rats were part of the story as well. So a lot of implications with that. I know we have some folks on from Texas, right? So if you're watching what is happening with nearing typhus in the coastal regions of Texas, we should all be very concerned, right? So again, here's a publication, you can look it up by the CDC, but um, just an example in 2018, they think there was 40 cases of nearing typhus, 12 were confirmed and 28 probable. So this is just really a huge issue. And so there's a whole, we don't have time today, but there's this whole um, background and history of nearing typhus in New Orleans, where it was incredibly prevalent for a very long period of time. And it wasn't really until I believe the 1970s, uh, late 70s, um, that they were able to get the incidence in people uh, down to zero. Um, but again, you know, there is no more in the in the early to mid, I think it was early 90s or so, the state of Louisiana Department of Health had money for surveillance of nearing typhus. And so they worked in conjunction with the city of New Orleans. Um, but that money has been since evaporated. And right now there just isn't really a surveillance program in our region for these pathogens. Now, we're again, working to change that. Um, and we're doing, you know, working, uh, making strides, I would say, uh, moving forward. But it's really also about creating a true surveillance system for rodents. So it kind of goes hand in hand. All right. So, so one of the things that I think is really underreported are rat bites and actually scratches. So if you're bit or scratched by a rat, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, it isn't, but it is in that you're, you're going to have potential um, you know, opportunity for pathogens, um, you know, to enter your body. So the CDC is estimating about 20,000 rat bites per year. You know, we don't get very many. I will say we've had two this year. One was actually happened last year and one scratch this year. And that was just because a resident happened to call us. Um, so there's no good mechanism to get this uh, information. And we really do need to change that. Uh, but there's some more information if you'd like to read more about rat bites. And what'll happen is the, there are bacteria, um, Streptobacillus moniformis, right? Or Spirillia minus that are in the gums uh, and teeth of these rats. And so they're transferred to people by bite, uh, by a bite. So um, we often think about hantavirus, right? There's different types of hantaviruses out there. The one that we think about in the East and the one we talked about here at um, Yosemite was the Hanta pulmonary uh, syndrome. So um, again, we're really looking at uh, passed by urine, feces, saliva, infected rodents. And so uh, every once in a while, you'll hear a case where there's a hunter that maybe skinned an animal um, you know, and they were able, and they were able to get infected. So we have to be real careful of where these infections in our region here in Louisiana are very extremely rare. Um, leptospirosis is caused by a bacteria, and um, important one actually. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the prevalence in our region. A mild to severe infection that can be fatal. We don't have um, in our region, again, we do have some cases of lepto, um, leptospirosis where you see it a lot, sometimes overseas. My family is Brazilian and so I sort of keep up on the news, but every once in a while, there'll be big floods in different places where people are, are sort of moving through the water and there'll often be lots of fatalities uh, by leptospirosis. So um, it's found in the water and food, can enter through the mucous membranes and abrasion. Uh, through your skin. So for example, if you're out there doing your inspections, you should always wear closed-toed shoes 
um, because we're always going through puddles and you know who knows what. So it's always best to wear good closed toed shoes, socks and shoes and all of that. Uh, we talked a little bit about salmonella too, um, but there you know also some bacterial diseases that could be an issue. This is not a picture of our region, but it was you know it's a good one that I found. And so go back and think about my story, right? Of you know that nori rat in that sewer system moving through from underground to above ground. And then next thing you know, it's on um, some of those food preparation, um, you know, uh, equipment. So it's really important that buildings remain closed and pest proofing is an important component of all of that. Now, one that's pretty interesting, and I think this is a nematode, it's called lungworm, Astrongeles cantonensis. It's a parasitic nematode. And it's between rats, um, the cycle is between rats and mollusks, usually slugs or snails uh, in its natural life cycle. So um, there's only been one case here in New Orleans, I believe it was in Orleans Parish many years ago, uh, but I know CDC is looking at this um, and they have been as sort of one of those emerging diseases. So pretty important. We're an accidental host. So if you have your home garden, for example, make sure that you're washing your lettuce and your vegetables, everything like that, because you may have a slug, a mollusk, a, um, some sort of gastropod that might be, um, you know, moving around, and you don't want to eat one of those gastropods <laughs> potentially. Um, again, Dr. Mike Blum, we're going to talk to him about him in a minute. He's got a, he actually has a graduate student that's looking at the prevalence of Astrongeles cantonensis in gastropods. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with that. But here's part of the life cycle anyway. Um, you know, we're that accidental host that ingests, um, but we wanna make sure that all of your food is cooked, okay? And um, always well washed. Um, all right, nearing typhus, right? So this is a big one as well that we're seeing um, in uh, that, from that paper from Galveston. We've also seen it in other places like California. Um, rats are the reservoir for this flea. Uh, um, uh, carried illness, right? So the flea here is going to be that vector. The oriental rat flea specifically is the most important vector of this disease. Um, and this is also another uh, bacteria. It's going to enter the bloodstream when an infected flea are scratched or rubbed um, into uh, a bite wound, right? Uh, into, the, into the skin. So again, very important for us. You know, we've had a lot of, there were, and I will talk about it here in a minute, but I guess it, it's caused by rickettsia typhi. Um, it occurs in California, southeastern U.S. Uh, we talked about this bite from an infected flea or mite, but flea is a common one here, broken skin. And so we're really concerned about people inhabiting infested areas with rodents um, where this flea is present. And so unfortunately, and you're going to see this in our data that I show here in a minute, uh, homeless encampments are a big problem. So, um, and of course we've seen this in, in California. We have not seen it here in our metropolitan area, but you know, we really have to stay on top of it. So it's important. It is found overseas as well. Um, so again, if you're traveling anywhere and you're not feeling weird when you get back or not right, it's always great to go to the physician and let them know where you have been. So this has been uh, 2018, huge outbreak, right, in Los Angeles, and to the point where their um, skid row is enormous, um, many, many, many blocks, and, you know, the people who are coming in to work those areas were getting infected. Uh, it even reached their city hall, uh, where people were getting sick inside their city hall, right? So super important to, for us to have the capacity to do surveillance, understand what's the population of these pathogens there. And when we deal with homeless encampments, and which we do, um, it's a very difficult situation, right? I don't, you know, it's very hard to find these sustainable solutions um, to have all these encampments removed. Um, not only, you know, you have to be careful with fleas jumping on you, or of course we're dealing with rodents, and it's primarily for us in our region, Norway rats is what we're dealing with. Um, you also have to be care careful of needles, um, human waste, you know, and other human communicable uh, diseases. So, uh, but 
even with that, you know, we're still, we still need to work in these spaces and do the best uh, that we can to keep uh, rats down. Now, the one thing that is, I'm going to just sort of very briefly on it, that has been a game changer in these encampments, we've been able to work with the EPA and Bell Laboratories based out of Wisconsin to have the um, uh, rat ice available to us. And what rat ice is simply dry ice, which is carbon dioxide. So we have the labels and we've been able to use dry ice, which is rat ice, it's called, and treat the burrows. And so that's an immediate knockdown of the rats, but it also kills the ectoparasites. So we don't have to worry about ectoparasites, fleas and mites jumping on people once we, we treat those burrows. So, you know, it's not a um, silver bullet. You have to go back and retreat, um, but it has really worked well for us. The other thing we've done in here, and I'm letting everybody know because there's other folks on this call that deal with this, is we've done a lot of pest proofing. So you can see there's a lot of concrete. We've used simply concrete to close up holes, and that's you know worked quite well for us as well. All right, there are more different type of um, you know typhus, scrub typhus, right? And um, this one's mostly associated with mites as well that live on rodents. And so simple, the symptoms include fever, um, a wound, at the wound site, you can have a rash on the trunk. Um, you can also have some uh, swelling of your lymph glands, right? So fatality, usually one to 60% if it's untreated. Now, the good thing is many of these uh, diseases, you can take an antibiotic, sort of bar, broad spectrum in some cases, and, and you're good to go. Um, briefly here, um, there are more, it just keeps going, right? So hantapulmonary syndrome, deer mouse, cotton rat, rice rat, white-footed mouse, those are very important. And you're breathing in that contaminated urine, urine or droppings. Um, there was actually, this was interesting, there was a, a case, this is 2009, I think it was, I have to go back and look, but it was many years ago. Um, there was a um, situation in central Louisiana where um, a lady went to go clean her camp. And what she was doing is sweeping the camp. It had been uh, closed for a long time. And she ended up dying of uh, hot pulmonary virus. So we, not only for this situation, but for any kind of rodent cleanup, there are very specific ways that it needs to be done. You don't ever wanna just get a vacuum and vacuum up droppings or urine or dust. So please visit, visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on how to clean up rodent droppings uh, because you actually have to wet the area down uh, with a disinfectant and there's a whole process, right? So that it doesn't go airborne and you get sick. LCMB virus, right? Mostly implicated with uh, mice, uh, but again, you can be breathing in dust, urine or droppings. You're typically not going to um, die of this one. Um, it's usually flu-like type symptoms, um, even if you have any. Um, so pretty important. Um, you can actually in, um, you could actually have some congenital abnormalities if a woman is um, infected early on in pregnancy. So there's a publication there if you wanna know more about it. So what's happening here in New Orleans, right? So just kind of give you an overview, uh, but you can go to the Centers for Disease Control. They have wonderful, um, it's a wonderful website on all these different kinds of diseases. But, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. You know, if you're looking at sort of just disease in general at most cities, it's not really well studied anymore, okay? There are some big centers, uh, university-based, uh, it's Vancouver, um, I think here in New Orleans, working with Tulane and now, also University of Tennessee, you've got places in New York, you've got Baltimore, you've got some of these locations, there are others um, where, you know, it is much better study, studied, but usually right now it's, it's a lot of universities that are stepping in with these big grants to help fund it. We've been trapping for a long time, um, even after Hurricane Katrina, uh, doing these rodent necropsies and ectoparasite identification, I think is sort of setting the, the sort of foundation, right, for setting up a true surveillance system. And the name of the game here is to partner with others. And when we started looking after Hurricane Katrina, there was a case of uh, Chapatulis virus. It's an old world hantavirus. And we wanted to look and see what was going on. And um, we did, it's called soul virus. And what we ended up doing is um, out of the six out of the 178 rodents we found, well, it was there, 
right? So there was a variant of that virus in the population. And so we don't know what those health outcomes, these are the locations here where you can see the little yellow, excuse me, red circles are negative with the triangle positive locations where we found them. We don't know what the health outcomes are. Um, we, there was no way to know, but we do know right, is that it's circulating in the population. So it's saying that it is definitely there, um, you know, but we have to learn more about it. And that really, you know, started partnerships with Tulane University and others um, on a big grant that Dr. Mike Blum was able to obtain. It was a big project with lots of different questions, but the cool thing was is that they used rats um, as the indicator species. And so a lot of comparison between flooded areas, unflooded areas, all these different income areas in New Orleans, um, all kinds of different questions that were asked. But the cool thing was, and you've seen this already, is that it did in those boxes in yellow or the different trap locations um, that we were able to um, set up. And so it started giving us a better picture, right, of sort of that rodent population that is in New Orleans. Now, I'm sure things changed a bit, um, but we do know parts of our city, especially on the northern part of the city, I mean, it is roof rat country, okay? And even in our uptown along the river bend, those are very much roof rats. Um, and then there are a big mix of Norways and roof rats in other parts of the city. So there were graduate students that were involved and, you know, all uh, over 2000 rodents were collected and necropsied. And which means that you know the tissues were taken, stored for future analyses. And guess what, guys? Bartonella was looked for, and it was all over, you know, the locations that were trapped, uh, where we trapped rodents. So it's very prevalent um, through our region. And then if you also look at Leptospira, right, which is a bacterium that causes leptospirosis, again, lots of prevalence throughout New Orleans. The bigger the circle, sort of the higher amount that was in that sample, but you know, the bottom line here, it's a positive or negative, and there's a lot of positive locations. And we talked a little bit about Astrangeles um, lungworm. And so again, another study looking at those same samples, and we're looking at an overall prevalence of about 38% in those rodents. We'll know more probably into next year with the, the with graduate student, what the prevalence of astrangeles is in the gastropods. But I mean, that's a pretty high number, I would say, you know, in the rodents. Now, fortunately, we don't see huge numbers of health outcomes, but the potential is always there. So I really do, I think everybody listening, um, I think everybody should look at their own cities you know, and ask the questions of, you know, what's here? Do we know? I mean, many of uh, wonderful universities in Texas, as well as here in Louisiana, we've got really fantastic vector control programs in Texas as well, um, that are doing some really interesting and, and good work. And so bottom line here, right, these animals are extremely good agents for disease transmission. They're around us, they're in our space, they're very adaptable, right? And I will tell you that historical and current data is gonna support the presence of the variety of these diseases that are associated with rodents and their ectoparasites. So in a lot of ways, if you're you know, working in a homeless encampment, but there's no data to support any kind of rodent uh, pathogens, I would err on the side of there are rodent pathogens based on what other work is being done around the country. So. Again, we have to be prepared for when the disease outbreak happens. What we don't want to do is say, ah, well, you know, health, health, health outcomes are pretty low, so it's just not going to happen, right? Well, it is going to happen. It's a matter of time. And so are we, you know, prepared um, holistically, you know, in our rodent control um, programs and also teamwork between agencies to really resolve the issue? All right, so my final comment on this one is make sure you wear your PPE. So when you're doing your inspections and you're in these properties, you really need to make sure you're wearing the right gear. And that may even be respiratory gear. I mean, granted, we're in COVID right now, where here in Louisiana, if you're inside of a, a building, you have to wear uh, a mask, right? 
but you your regular surgical uh, mask or your not surgical but surgical style mask or cloth mask is not going to stop these viral particles um, so you know that a hantavirus or some other thing so we often recommend that we wear when you're doing these inspections and if you're going into a closed space you're wearing those N95 properly and then of course when you go home um, I leave my shoes at the door. I don't wear them inside my house. You know, my work clothes go to the washing machine separately. So it's important not to mix so that you're not potentially contaminating. All right. So with that, I, I think, uh, I guess we'll open it up for some questions, right? And uh, we're going to talk about outreach ideas here in a few minutes. I can't see the chat if there's any. We've got questions. We've got answers. Right. Oh yeah, I've been busy researching. And outreach and polling. So I am bringing it up. Do you want us to do the outreach idea first or ask the experts? We've got. We can do ask the other. You want to swap it up a little bit? Sure. Okay. We're on schedule. Yep. I'm gonna do a stop share. In the very beginning about doing rodent control regarding um, two types of chem chemicals. I cannot find the original. Is that the one about the 10, uh, 1080 and the, the red scroll? Yes. Yeah, okay, I had to look this up because I had never heard of the, I had 1080 I heard of. I knew that was banned already. I didn't know why. So it's banned because it's a slow, painful death. It's pretty much tortured to the animals. So the only countries on earth that it's still allowed in is Australia, New Zealand, and that's just for possum control of all things. Uh, but everywhere else, totally banned, cruel and unusual punishment for the animals. And as for the red squill, uh, it's there's no longer a product available in America, but there are some international products you can buy with it. But the problem is palatability. Uh, everything I read on it said rats refuse to eat it. They haven't found anything they can mix it with yet. Now in labs, when they force feed the animals, it is very effective when you force an animal to eat it. And it's very green and very little effect to anything with a gag reflex. Uh, because that was the number one thing they were pushing on how safe it is. But if rats don't eat it, it's useless to me. Uh, so... I said it's in our red too. It's been used since like um, going back to ancient times. Since we've come out of caves, pretty much we've been using this as a rodenticide, but it's just not an effective rodenticide. So hopefully that answers that question. And I believe we've covered in detail about the cat question, other than the fact about cats completely eating wax. Now, what what we probably should cover and we didn't is, is there any animal that will eat a dead rodent? Yes, possibly. And it's not so much an animal as well as um, there are birds. So the question is about transferability of, of rodenticide from animal to animal by eating them. Uh, yeah. the, the chances of the animal getting a lethal dose of rodenticide are very slim because first, when the rodents eat the poison, uh, their, their body's processing it, it's metabolizing it. So most of the poison is actually broken down before any animal can, when, it, when the animal dies. So anything that consumes it wouldn't be getting even close to a full dose. Uh, and not just that too, rodenticides are weight-based, meaning, uh, the bigger the animal, the more it has to consume to get a lethal dose. So it, it would need to consume a large amount. It's not impossible. It's just highly improbable. Uh, even a bird of prey would need to consume dozens of rats upon dozens in a row consecutive over days to get that lethal dose built in it. Uh, so very unlikely nowadays with modern rodenticides that you'd get a poisoning like that. Uh, so hope that helps, because like I said, if you start doing the math on the labels, you can figure out whether your dog, you know, consumed lethal dose. But personally, if your dog consumes rodenticide, bring it to a vet, because it's always better to be safe than sorry. Okay. And also, secondary kill is one thing, and it's also where you're trapping and dating what's out there and what's being used. I mean, you could spend a whole day on just the rodenticide part. Now, yeah. 
done or legal? For sanitarians communicating with the industry, give everybody a couple of really good talking points on how do they communicate the importance of pest control because here is where the barely I'm right with you. Your regulations talk about all this food safety stuff, and it loosely states, yeah, you're supposed to have pest control, but nowhere in public health regulations does it say you yeah, really have to have a license pest control application. On the same token, on pest control, we're told to do pest control, but we don't understand what we're doing when it comes to around food. So what are your, what's a couple of good lines, Claudia, that the sanitarians can use with their food-based clients on why they need to use and why they need to follow these conducive condition recommendations? Right. So I, and again, Carolyn, thanks for putting this in there because so I'm going to go back to this partnership and we'll come up with a couple of talking points, right? I might have to think about it a little bit, but this is a partnership between the client, the owner, right? Or the restaurant or the company, whatever it may be, the pest control company and, you know, the uh, regulatory agency. It's a partnership because everybody has to work together because um, to be honest, a lot of times what we're seeing is, you know, sort of taking up for the pest control industry is they're often recording and noting and letting those clients know what needs to be done, but the clients don't do it. And it's frustrating, right, for everybody because the pest control company does not want callbacks. It costs money for them to keep going back over and over and over. Plus, I don't want to necessarily lose their client, right? So if let's say your agency comes in and, and shuts the, the place down, maybe that client, you know, will uh, terminate their contract, whatever. But the whole point is it's got to be a partnership. So, I mean, I think the way we typically like to do things is from a safety standpoint, public safety standpoint. Um, so I think, you know, everybody working together to remediate those conducive conditions are going to prevent any kind of safety and liability problems for their clients. I think that's number one. You know, and I mean, sometimes I will say, Carolyn, there are clients, uh, companies that just don't get it. And so it's important, I think, for our sanitarians and our restaurant inspectors that you know, we try to work with our, our people, but some people don't get it and you have to just, you know, hit them where it hurts, which is often the pocketbook, you know, to make them learn the hard way. But I think, you know, step number one here is it's all about prevention. It's about preventing problems. It's about saving money. It's about, you know, and saving money can be their kitchen's not going to be shut down. If they're fixing the holes in their property and their door sweeps and all of that, it's going to save them money in electrical, in heating and air conditioning costs. Um, there's a lot of just benefits, right? Of prevention of problems on, the, on sort of the big scale. Um, so what's, I think that's kind of one. I'll have to think about a nice clean talking point for you. <laughs> sort of that's just me talking. I mean, Janet, do you have Anything else that you sort of want to, to talk about that with? But, you know, I think part of it is we need to bring our pest control partners with our um, state and local partners all in one room. And it might be a Zoom room, right? Where we're all sort of listening to the same thing. And um, this is part of what we hope to do with the CDC project is, and this is part of it, you know, is get everybody on the same page and understand your concerns, their concerns, in our concerns and how do we all work together to really do behavior change, um, which is basically do better about cleaning and some of these conducive conditions so that we don't just create the best environment for rodents. So I don't know if that helps a little bit, but I'll, I'll come up with some you know better talking points. I need to think about it. 
Okay, uh, next on the list, uh, we're going to skip the Anderson for a second because that's that's a whole other discussion. Uh, we're going to jump straight to the comment beneath it real quick for the active ingredient in rat poison is warfarin. Okay, that is uh, yes and no. Okay, we have two different types of rodenticides we're using primarily currently, first generation, second generations. Uh, warfarin is actually a first generation anticoagulant, which is almost never used now because our rodent populations across the world have become resistant to warfarin. So they can eat tons of it without getting a lethal dose. In fact, that is probably the least common in, uh, ingredient you're gonna find in a rodenticide nowadays. That being said, uh, there we do use anticoagulants and that is pre pretty much our primary uh, mode of action or active agent in our rodenticides now. Uh, but and vitamin K1 is the antidote for it. Vitamin K, you are correct. Vitamin K is found in pet food. It's found in, in all kinds of stuff in cereal and uh, but vitamin K1 and the concentration needed to be an antidote for and for rodenticides and anticoagulants is going to have to be administered by a veterinarian through an injection in the animal. Okay, if you feed your dog dog food because it ate rodenticide, your dog's gonna it's not gonna help the dog at all. Uh, so this is just that's fine not enough. Now you should pay attention for rodents in pet food areas, but not for that reason. You should pay attention because rodents want to eat pet food. Uh, the correlation between the bait and that, there, there isn't any. Uh, so yeah, that's where we're at with that. And as for the Anison thing, I don't know where that question came from, honestly, because that doesn't link to the other two rodenticides we discussed earlier. So hopefully that helps out. And just in case you guys are not familiar with what is currently used as rodenticides in the United States, that MPIC rodenticide fact sheet is the most current. It has basically what we use. Strychnine, while it is there, it is really not used in the structural pest control world. I do see it in ag. So that's in. That could be problematic because again, if it's in an ag area and they are also doing um, raw food production, you've got to be real careful about what's being used where. So again, when you're doing raw commodity inspections, look for different things that might be setting a trigger off for something else. All right. So any other questions for the experts? So going back to um, uh, one of the questions asked before, because I cannot answer the question in the Orleans. Um, Jim, because I'm in Texas, and I don't believe Louisiana requires y'all to record it. And it's hard to hear you a little bit. Who, me? Yeah, sorry. Well, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Is that better? Yes, thank you so much. So the question was about murine typhus crossing over to humans in New Orleans. You got an answer? So I don't know any current cases. We would have to, you know, get with our state and see if there's been any cases. Um, I, there's historical data. I'm happy to throw in a couple um, papers. Let me find them after my talk. Um, but I don't have any information of actual reported cases recently. I think I would have probably have heard them through our state partners at the EPI department, but I have not heard anything. But I am concerned. <laughs> so that's why, you know, we've made some changes, especially using rat ice uh, here in New Orleans. So we made some strides. It's not great, but I'll tell you, it's better than what it was. So, Carolyn, here's my spiel on how you sell pest control, because I do this all the time. And it has to go down to public health. You, y'all as sanitarians, code enforcement, and the like, when you're going in, the perception is from the public, you're protecting me, the consumer, from getting something public health related, mostly foodborne illness. 
what most people don't put together because we don't do a lot of training. And even when we do HACCP training, we like blow through it is pest control equals foodborne illness, period, final. It doesn't matter if it's rodents. It doesn't matter if it's flies, cockroaches, ants, bed bugs, you name it. One way or the other, there is something going on if there is a pest problem within a facility. That equates to the consumer, you don't really care about my health. If I'm a business manager or owner, they live and die on if the food is good or not good. Everybody gets sick, you don't have a business. So you try to drive their interest behind their bottom dollar. I mean, who, who doesn't love when um, Gordon Ramsay goes into a said food establishment and you see what's going wrong and he gigs them, gigs them on simple stuff. Timmy, like cleaning said pot that's been in storage before using. I mean, it's, it's little things like that. Basically, inspectors of, I'm going to say this, and this is where you, this is going to lead right into our outreach ideas, is you know your folks. You know who you're working with. Timmy said it, Claudia said it, and I'll remind you what we all said. You don't have to be the, the cop with the stick. You can be the cop with the carrot. And what I mean by that is when you go into these and even if they've got a bad thing, unless they are really bad offenders, then just throw the book at them and find out what partners you need to go throw, throw the book at them. But it, it point out stuff to them, educate. By the way, did you know? I mean, yeah, those little fact things are really what sticks in people's head. By the way, did you know that that mouse or that rat poops and pees all the time? And when you see all those droppings, that means that that is their marking station. Now, do you have dogs or cats? Do you understand about that? What about do you hunt? Start relating what, what you, what's known and then throw it back in that mammal world or that insect world. And people start going, uh, uh oh. Okay, so outreach ideas, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I do that a lot. All right, let me uh, show this to you guys and change swap. All right, can you see my slides yet or no? No. no. All right, sorry. Try sharing your screen. Share screen and here you go. Sure. All right, you can see it now. Everybody can see it. Okay. All right. So some of these ideas, you know, some of the things that we just talked about, um, I think I want you to keep in mind and you know, please use the chat and give us ideas. Okay. Um, and this is a team effort here when it comes to education. We've got a group, right, of folks. And I'll be honest with you. I mean. We've, we've always done a lot of education, but it's really been very focused to the industry, right? If it's pest control and our government workers and things like that, where through workshops and um, all kinds of meetings, and we just never really had the staff, um, you know, and the budget to do um, schools and, you know, from like on a big sort of city level, which we hope to change that here very soon. So. There's a quite a few people that are part of this and you know a lot of it it's most everyone in our group touch education in some capacity. So this actually happens to be a picture from a couple of years ago at Bunkfest. So it was one of our sort of new um, offerings. Um, and that really was for the public and it was very kid centric actually. But look, what are we trying to do here with education? And I love this example. It's about behavior change, right? We all know that we need to eat lettuce and asparagus and tomatoes, really most of our meals, but, you know, do our exercises every day and all that business. 
um, but it's really difficult to change our behavior. So we're talking about here our own health, but I want you to think about rodent control, right? It can be the public, it can be a restaurant, it can be a grocery store, it can be whoever, you know, um, that uh, they may need to change their behavior, but somehow or other they don't for a variety of reasons, um, but it just doesn't happen. And so when you think about integrated pest management, right? Everything we do, everything that Janet does in Texas is all based around IPM, period. I don't care if we're doing termites or mosquitoes or rats or raccoons or whatever. It might be in a school. We always have to think about sort of that holistic approach. And I want all of you guys to think the same way, if at all possible, right? You can fix one little thing, you know, but if you don't fix the big problem, that little thing isn't gonna go away forever. It'll be back, okay? And so it's important to think about how we can fix it. And public education is an integral part of, of IPM. That is what it is. And so what we try to do is try to get a bigger audience from the general public to businesses, to industry, public agencies like we're doing today. And so let's talk a little bit about some examples. Now, there are lots of examples in the scholarly literature, right, of integrated pest management. And there you can snapshot it. You can go take a look. I mean, there's some really cool projects on mosquitoes, cockroaches, bed bugs. I mean, a lot of different things, right? Um, but not all of them are really that successful if you think about it from the long term, right? We're looking for a long term, economical, effective, you know, programs and outreach, and it's really often a big challenge. And so our real audience here that I'm concerned about, I mean, I'm concerned about a lot of people, but our big audience are the residents of Orleans Parish. That is, you know, that's, that's our audience. You know, we need everybody to get on board to throw their trash properly. You know, if they have a dumpster to make sure that the lid's on, it's not overflowing like that one, you know, it's not okay because this is where we start to get rodent problems. You know, sort of the traditional community outreach door to door is what a lot of agencies do. And it takes a lot of time. It's very wearing on the employees. It is, you know, how really effective is it when you go and someone's at work and you can't go in their yard unless you're, you're invited in, right? So there's, you know, how effective really is it? Sometimes you have to do it and we do here and there, um, but you know, on a grand scale, it's not really ideal. So when you think about your audience, right? This is my audience. And I know Carolyn's on the line. Uh, Carolyn, I want you to think about who your audience is and everybody else that's on there, right? You know, I have a big audience. And so of course, even our employees, you know, we've got employees that have been on board for a year and a half to people that have been here for uh, 52 years. <laughs> everybody in between. And so we have to make sure that everyone is educated on our topic. We work with state folks and universities and the public, our mayor, city council members, international audience, even the media. I mean, the media is a powerful tool uh, where you, we can try to get our messages across to the public. And of course, very important are our residents, right? So your audience is often very, very large. And guess what, guys? One, one thing, one strategy doesn't fit all. And so often you have to have multiple strategies so that you can be effective across target audiences. So there's a little picture of a little kid. That's my little kid, like seven years ago. Oh my goodness, right? But is dealing with the little kids as well as dealing with the industry, dealing with folks that may not have social media, um, also dealing with the social media super techie group. And then you're also going to have groups of people that are, you know, anti pesticides or anti using glue boards or snap traps. So, um, you know, just pick a topic. And so it's very important that we're effective across all those different audiences. 
And so you want to determine why you're conducting outreach and education, right? So for us in here in Mosquitoes, it might be removing containers and standing water. We want to make sure that people, um, right now we're here in Orleans Parish, we're doing a lot of dumpster inspections, right? We want people to store trash properly and follow local regulations because this overflowing trash is going to provide food for rodents. And also improving sanitation practices and disposing of waste tires, you know, and some of these are very, very challenging. And I'm not sure we have necessarily the answer, but we do need to try to get creative and find ways. And so I think part of it is really trying to understand your audience, right? So the way we're doing this training for you is going to be very different than we would be doing a homeowner series, for example, for our general public, which we have done. Right, so it's just you you have a different need. Um, so, but we still need to get that same good information across. Pretty important. So, also, please don't just think that people want just like Twitter feeds. Okay, now granted, that's very strong and powerful tools. We use it as well, and it, you have the access of hitting, you know, not hitting, but basically reaching a lot of people. But there are a lot of people who want that piece of paper in their hand or they want to see it in print and so we're exploring those things now um, as well and you know sort of define that brand right so here's a good one is clean up nola there's actually clean up nola 2.0 uh, which i'm part of that team and so you know we're looking at all of this right now to try to get those messages and those priorities across um, to our residents um, but it's really important we try to do uh, some consistency in how our products look um, so that it automatically will be tagged to us uh, with that and we're working on like for example working on websites and our social platforms and you know we just started our social platform december of last year um, and we've got two people uh, in our group that really manage those uh, platforms which is really nice and so there's Myth Mondays, there's fact of the week on Fridays, there's some consistency so that people hopefully will be looking forward to learning something and, you know, sort of chiming in. So um, also just providing some, you know, interesting, you know, opportunities. This is what we talked about. So if it's bug of the week, for example, um, we talked about here again, fact of the week, and it's just really getting our sort of simplistic messages across of like, this is a really great one where, you know, we don't spray for mosquitoes on a schedule. Well, why, right? That is probably one of our, one of our most common questions. What's your schedule for spraying? Well, we don't spray on a schedule, but these are the reasons why. So it's just pushing out really good information for people to understand how and what we do. Um, I love bees. These are Myth Mondays, right? So there's just so many things um, that if maybe people just don't have the right information. And cats came up, so let's talk about it, right? So a lot of programs across the country that have cat releases. But guess what? There is no scientific data that supports um, that cat uh, populations actually decrease uh, rodent populations. Right. In order to do that work, I mean, it's almost like you would be evaluating a rodenticide for efficacy, for example. You have to take pre counts and then introduce and then post counts and look at all of that. So, you know, it's important for us to get sort of that good scientific messages out. And so these are just ideas. And again, if you have ideas that you'd like for us to tap into, uh, please put them in the chat. And of course, you can always email us at education at nola.gov. And so part of two is like, you know, we're out and about and we see some of the issues that we think are important to communicate. And these are some of them, right? It's just some basic understanding. Did you know? It was kind of another little series. Uh, just giving some folks some information. I mean, it, it may even be, um, I wanna do actually one on the local regulations and ordinances that are on the books for rodents and vermin control, right? But people just don't go to the city website and look through all of the ordinances. So let's push out some of this good information. Uh, another good one here is feeding the birds and feeding your pets in the backyard. You know, these are tying into real world problems that we're seeing. And so again, I appreciate everybody that's on the call because we have to do this as a team. It has to be a multi-agency approach, right? So working with CDC, our Department of Health, our communications department, 
our health department. We are actually an independent uh, 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 agency, like a, a department, we have a board. So we're not embedded in the health department, but they're our partners. I mean, we talk to them constantly and we also talk to our state partners all the time and our CDC folks. So everybody has to be on the same page with a unified message. message. And we often have many of these press releases, things like that, that we have ready to go. So nice, clear uh, messages that we want the public to do. This is a nice one here too, you know, and this actually is a success story. You'll see if you're in New Orleans that there are a lot more of these uh, types of garbage cans around. Um, so that was a partnership, you know, with the sanitation department. There's some benefits, obviously, of using these that are not just because of rodents, um, but it sure does a great job, you know, at keeping um, uh, the food away from rats. Another thing is, um, you know, just understanding, and this is uh, something that was put together last year, is looking at the city guidelines for dumpsters and looking at the state guidelines, right? And making the connection for folks that proper dumpster management is rodent prevention. It is, right? So let's just give people a few tips because maybe that person that's working in that store or in that restaurant, they just don't know the rules. So it's not that, you know, we can't assume that somebody doesn't want to do something. I don't think that's really the case. I think a lot of times people just don't know. And I think, you know, that's where if we can work, all of us work together and start pushing out this information. And so we actually made magnets of the little um, dumpster guidelines. And then we also, I believe, have flyers of the dumpster management, or we will have those done as well. So We'll work with our Louisiana state partners on this one. You know, we can talk about it after, but I think it's, you know, very, very useful. Also just getting creative, right? So this is um, one of our um, employees that created this and guess what? So these little bookmarks went to the library. So again, trying to reach other people in different ways. And so they're really great. There's one on rodents. We've got one on termites and on mosquitoes. Um, we're going to be printing more of these and our goal hopefully here in 2022 is to be able to get these to our schools that can be disseminated through so it's kind of a fun uh, type of thing we also have more technical brochures and um, you know it's not just a simplistic you know couple lines but it could be a little bit more complicated with a little bit more information um, just to provide more content with your local environment so this is a nice uh, example of a shotgun New Orleans house and um, just letting them know what we need them to know, right? Um, it may even be in this case, mosquitoes with a little bit of identification and then also targeting when we had Zika virus, uh, state, uh, our health department created some uh, Zika virus, you know, brochures uh, targeting uh, healthcare providers. So we can't assume that for example, a physician may not know the, the life cycle, the entomological component, right, of that life cycle. So we need to make sure that we're, you know, communicating all that information. It's all about partnerships. Um, this, that was 2018. This was a lot of fun. We hope to have this hopefully next year, right? Uh, we will see. Um, we'll see what the local conditions um, allow us to do. Um, but this was a great opportunity. So people on the call hopefully will be able to participate next year. And then, of course, there's that traditional method of working at different fairs and, and getting information out. And what we find is people love to look at the mosquitoes and the rats and, you know, they're very much interested. So we just need to make sure we're providing that great information and letting public, the public know why it's so important and relate it back to that, you know, those health uh, prevention of health outcomes. Again, training, right, of our industry, sort of the mindset on this is, you know, the more people we have trained, um, with a full understanding of rodent control, you know, it'll be more boots on the ground um, that are going to be essentially helping us and everybody together with our mission of basically good environmental practices and rodent prevention. We also do the recertification uh, for our pest control industry. Now, of course, this is pre-COVID. Uh, things are virtual. Uh, for now, uh, but eventually one day we'll get back uh, to in-person training. Um, and, you know, it's important to be able to have that in person when you can. We've got lots of microscopes and, you know, it's about identification. If you don't know your bug, if you don't know your rat, you're going to have a hard time making those recommendations. And so we offer Mosquito Academy, Rodent Academy, uh, Pest Control Academy, 
um, and even a termite academy. And those will be all coming up. If anybody wants to get on our email list, please email us at education at nola.gov. And so again, when we're able to have these really have to be more in person, so we'll get there eventually. Um, but it's really those hands on, um, you know, learning things in person, looking at equipment and, you know, they're short and um, period of time. So it doesn't eat up everybody's day, but hopefully we'll, we'll learn. Now, when it comes to the public, I think it's really important. And actually, you know, even our industry, I appreciate everybody that's taken the survey because it really provides sort of that insight that we need to make decisions, right? And where we're gonna go with education. And just a really brief and good example, I think is uh, we did a um, survey of our public on uh, knowledge and practices concerning the legal uh, dumping of tires in our metropolitan New, in our New Orleans area. And so, of course, you know, we're working here with Dr. Imelda Moyes at the University of Miami. She's a public health geographer. Um, she's got a lot of uh, experience working with surveys and how to setting, setting them up and, you know, all the statistical information that you need for it to be a valid survey. And so we were able to get it disseminated. And of course, you want to try to get a very good represented uh, population that you have. And we asked a lot of different questions so that we can really understand where people are seeing tires. So here's one for abandoned lots. So a good majority see them in abandoned lots, right? Um, you know, and pretty interesting here, would you be willing to participate in a volunteer program to pick it up? Some people would, but mm, some people not so much, right? So we have to really understand. And also what was so critical here, look at this one. Do you know that the city will pick up four tires um, when placed next to the garbage cans on the second collection? And the answer was no, a lot of people did not know that. And with that, you know, I'll show you something that we did, but that, resulted in, in, in marketing on our part on um, tire, uh, how to discard waste tires. So that was a, a specific tangible item that we created um, to educate our public. And again, I talked a lot about, you know, not only social media, but people want to hear things on radio and television and sometimes the internet and billboards. So it's not only social media platform. You have to really, you know, look at your population, um, your residents, and see what people, you know, would prefer. So pretty important. Look, when we're doing all of this, I mean, look at how awesome these dumpsters are, right? Woo, beautiful site. And so this is what we're going for. Nice, clean, closed dumpsters. And so we want to bring attention to the topic. We want to show the importance, tell people why it's important and really the consequences of, you know, why it's important and doing those things we're asking. We have to do continual reinforcement. That's been shown in a lot of those publications that I, you know, posted early on, uh, because in some cases when you, when those researchers left that area or stopped doing the mosquito control inspections, things kind of went back to the way they were which is not what we want. So we wanna to continue to reinforce some of these, con these concepts. And so behavior change is increased in education, right? Um, it may come from many of you regulatory agencies and fines and restrictions, right? Sometimes it's what it takes. We don't want that, but unfortunately, sometimes it has to happen and increased benefit of the actions, right? So a great example, is in 2012, we worked in a school, we, we got a, a project from EPA to do verifiable integrated pest management in schools here in Orleans Parish. And we picked three different types of schools. And I'm just gonna very briefly talk about the most challenging school. So we had a school that was over hundred years old. It was poorly maintained, tremendous pest and rodent pressure, very bad, okay? And the um, place was just not very clean. It was just basically a mess. And it took 18 months, but do you know that that whole building did a 180 degree turnaround? By the time we were done in there, same building, the build, the holes were closed, the building was clean, it was beautiful. The rats and mice were gone, right? And there was a whole attitude change in that entire building because of the pest issues. No more cockroaches, they were gone. So it is absolutely possible. And so once we did it, you know, everyone started to see the benefit, right? It's like that pendulum sort of swinging and it started to swing in the right direction. 
And um, once everybody really understood what the benefits were, things just, just move so beautifully in the right direction. And so we have to really show folks that these things can work. All right, summary here. Understand your audience. Try to target and message to each of these groups, right? Because everyone's going to be a little different. Um, and thoughts and perceptions can change, you know, over time. And, you know, data-based programs. So it's not just like, I kind of think we should. It's really understand why we should, right? And so it's going to help you understand your, um, your audience, your target audience. That's where these surveys are very important. Um, try to communicate with your staff, obviously, as best as possible to try to make sure that they understand why you're doing something. Um, and look, I talk about vector control all day long. Like I love talking about it. It doesn't matter who it is, I talk about it. And we all should be doing the same, right? Within your own areas of expertise and how important rats and managing rats really, really is. And some are huge challenges. I mean, you know, if it's uh, homeless encampments are a challenge, it is also tire dumping is a challenge. So, but you can't really give up, right? We have to continue to move forward. So I think that gives you a little bit of insight on how we're trying to do some of our education. Um, and I am looking for ideas, right? So if there's something that you come across that you're just like, oh my goodness, I absolutely need a fact sheet on this topic. Or can you just create a tweet? I've got some, you know, we've got very talented people um, at our office um, that can create these documents and let's share them, right? So um, let's not have to reinvent the wheel on education. All right, so with that, does anybody else have any questions? Because I think we are about to do an evaluation and wrap it up. All right, Janet. All right, so I think, um, I'm, I don't know, maybe Janet's on mute, but um, okay, so what we're gonna do guys, we're gonna do, I believe we're gonna do a post-test. Um, I've been calling while you were talking because we're, we're almost out of time. Oh, great, I'm so glad. I'm so excited to see our pre and post, right? Okay, so we've got the poll. If you didn't take that one, make sure you have. Um, Again, certificates will be emailed to you within the next couple of weeks. At the same time, when we do email those certificates, we will um, post the link to where you can find the recordings of this of these presentations. Um, again, if there is any future education ideas, presentations you want us to cover, especially because y'all are sanitarians and we are a different, um, we present different material than the normal stuff. Do email myself, Claudio, or this education at nola.gov. We're, we're happy to help you guys. Um, other than that, I realize it's almost quarter past 12. So if you gotta go, go. If not, thank you, Claudia, Timmy. Thank you all for, for presenting. Thank you for everyone for, for attending. We hope we, yes. we hope you learned at least one thing today. Yep. Most of you said you did, but. <laughs> and and just, a, just a little shout out. There's some uh, nice to see some of our uh, partners here. I'm looking at the list of people that are in. Thank you so much. Actually, for I just, you know, I don't work, I work in Louisiana. So I just want to give a huge thank you to our state sanitarians for being incredibly responsive and um, really working as partners with the city of New Orleans. So we really appreciate it. There's also some other folks from other parishes in there, Plaquemines. Uh, thank you for attending. And um, there's a long history of working with some of these folks. So all right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to um, sign out. And again, let us know if there's any other topics you would like. Thanks for taking the time.